good morning. Um, I'm Reed Kramer of the New America Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you here for uh, this event, 50 years since the war on poverty, looking back and moving forward. And uh, I've actually been looking forward to this event uh, for some time since uh, my colleague Sean um, Firmstead and I began talking about organizing this kind of discussion that would examine the historic legacy of our social policy system and see how it's impacting current uh, policy debates. Uh, we quickly teamed up with some colleagues. Melissa Boteak at the Center for American Progress uh, agreed to co-sponsor and participate. And uh, Willie Elliott from the University of Kansas um, and also a senior research fellow here at New America um, thought he would use the occasion to release uh, a new report from his uh, Assets and Education Initiative and uh, that report, which there are copies available, uh, is called Harnessing Assets to Build an Economic Mobility System. And it's available uh, online on the event page, uh, as well as hard copies here. Um, we'll hear from uh, Melissa and Willie in the second uh, panel. But I'll note, if you want to join the conversation online, uh, you can do so by using the hashtag TalkPoverty, and then follow us at, uh, at Assets. NAF, N-A-F, or at half and 10. Um, my remarks will begin with the observation that uh, really the dynamic history of the 1960s is providing a pretty amazing set of 50th anniversary um, events to commemorate. Uh, last year we had the historic Civil Rights March on Washington for 1963. This past fall it was the assassination of JFK. Uh, next year, it will be the historic march from Selma to Montgomery. And these were all watershed moments in our nation's uh, history. And I think there's really a, a civic obligation to take a moment to reflect upon them and, and consider their, their impacts. The war on poverty is particularly worthy given the large scope of, of programs that were created, that were launched at this time. And as we're going to hear from our historian that we've brought in our ringer, uh, Alice O'Connor, who's joining us from UC Santa Barbara, uh, the war on poverty was not just one thing. It was a multifaceted effort that acknowledged the significant scale of the problems at hand, uh, the need for interventions that cut across program areas, and also the, 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 the uh, structural obstacles that were created by the economy and, and really the legacy of racial discrimination. So when LBJ announced uh, in his State of the Union in January 1964 this ambitious goal to improve the outlook for the millions of Americans that were living on the outskirts of hope, uh, I think it's important to recall he, he'd only been president for seven pretty tumultuous weeks. And it was in March of that year, 64, 50 years ago this month, that he forwarded the initial uh, legislative package to Congress that would eventually become the Economic uh, Opportunities, the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. Um, many of the programs that were uh, part of that effort or related efforts uh, continue to serve to this day as part of our social safety net. They were either created or bolstered as part of this effort. And it was a bipartisan effort, uh, important to, uh, to note. And th this includes food stamps, SNAP, um, Social Security, other cash assistance programs, things that we traditionally think of as the social safety net. Um, however, if we focus just on these programs, really, we're not getting the whole uh, story. There were efforts around health care with Medicare and Medicaid. There were job uh, um, and employment training programs like uh, Job Corps, VISTA. Uh, education was a big part of the push with Title I and Head Start, and there were even others. So it was really a, a large undertaking. And I think to the credit of the architects of the effort, they really were acknowledging some really important interconnections. Um, ending discrimination, creating economic opportunities, these were the strategic objectives that were trying to unify uh, the effort, and then this would lead to uh, a full employment uh, economy. Uh, another point that's worth kind of recognizing is, is the context in, in, at that time was really the, the civil rights movement that was making very strong demands uh, on the system, that was really creating this impetus for uh, action. So numerous programs were created that had specific uh, activities, but from another perspective, war on poverty 
expanded federal government's reach in, in these broad areas of health, uh, you know, educational, and kind of economic uh, outcomes. So these were big aspirations. And it's fair to ask, you know, what was achieved? Uh, now we have a contemporary critique of, of Paul Ryan and some of the other uh, conservatives and Republican uh, voices in Congress, and they're claiming that you know poverty won, uh, and you know that might be more simplistic than I think we're looking to uh, get to today, but really they're saying that government has unwittingly created some poverty traps. It's 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 government um, policy that is preventing people from moving forward. So the Ryan report that came out uh, uh, recently. Uh, kind of cataloged all of the programs that the federal government's involved in that um, uh, are, are kind of in, in play here. And, um, you know, he said they're complex, they're overlapping, and, and even the, the generosity of them is undercutting work uh, efforts. So that's their uh, critique. I think it might be less relevant in terms of how we think of the war on poverty than it is for looking at the contemporary set of means-tested federal programs. Um, but it is you know, part of the current uh, dynamic. And I think I would argue that War on Poverty vision in its original manifestation you know, dramatically changed what the expectations were for, uh, for the society, you know, what constitutes a fair and uh, a civilized society. And it, then it, it reaches into a lot of other things beyond these means-tested programs like labor standards and legal representation and the right to vote. These were all things that were uh, part of, of the broad uh, effort. Uh, further, I think there's a case to be made that we've seen some objective progress. Uh, for starters, um, poverty has declined since the uh, uh, early 1960s. It's declined by, by more than a third by many measures. Uh, then we can look at 2012 alone and see that public policies lifted probably around 45 million people uh, out of poverty. Uh, you know, there are limitations with these systems. We, we have cash assistance like TANF programs that uh, don't expand during a recession, but the countercyclical nature of food stamps and SNAP, uh, the SNAP program, um, you know, did have a very significant mit mitigating effect. Uh, so it would have been a lot worse uh, without these kind of programs uh, uh, in place. Uh, we can also acknowledge that too many Americans still live on the economic margin, that regardless of how we measure poverty, we've got, we've got persistent levels of poverty, we've got scandalous rates of child poverty in this country, we've got in increasing indicators of inequality, and really a lot less mobility than uh, people assume. Given the pervasive partisan uh, dialogue that's out there in the country and in Washington, I think it's um, a challenge about, you know, can we do better? Um, and generally in the current debates, I th the left wants to talk about inequality as, as it's um, um, becoming more apparent with more evidence. Uh, the right has countered that by saying we need to talk about mobility and people's ability to rise up the, uh, the ladder. Uh, I'll say that that actually creates a little bit more common ground than we might uh, assume, and it, and it might be the basis for a renewed policy effort. Uh, the mobility framework can be very constructive, I think, in how we think about uh, poverty, and it leads to questions about what are the tools and the resources that a person needs to make progress uh, in their lives. And this is where uh, the assets perspective comes in. This is a lot of the work that we do here at, uh, at New America. Um, historically, poverty is focused on income because it's a proxy for uh, consumption. It's a way to look at how people's immediate needs can be uh, addressed. Um, but I think we know that economic well-being isn't determined at a, at a single moment uh, in time. Um, it also, uh, the hardship involves deficits of getting access to resources, information, and other kinds of uh, opportunities. Uh, and when these uh, deficits are, um, you know, compounded over time, it can be particularly uh, debilitating. And this is where mobility uh, matters. For many families moving up and out of poverty uh, and to achieve kind of economic stability and security, it's going to require both income and assets. Uh, people can't just be expected to spend their way out of poverty. They need to gain access to the kind of resources that can help them uh, move ahead. Uh, and this is where even you know, small amounts of savings 
um, that are available for families to access when there are income disruptions or un unexpected events can be very, um, very, very meaningful, uh, even, even modest uh, amounts. Um, the other part of the theory is that uh, having a small amount of assets even can change, uh, have behavioral effects, can change the way you think about and plan for uh, the future. So anyway, that's the theory of how uh, assets matter, and I think increasingly we've seen evidence, an evidence base, that this theory um, has some um, validity. Um, so if that's true, uh, it has implications for how we conceive, design, and implement uh, social policy. And that's the theme of, of a book that uh, was just released uh, this week. Uh, I was co-editor of with my colleague Trina Shanks uh, from Michigan. Um, you have a handout that uh, was on the um, uh, table coming in. And uh, in 13 chapters, uh, it looks at the rise of the asset building perspective and how it's impacted social policy thinking uh, over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, one of my chapters in that book uh, identifies a, an agenda that uh, builds upon a policy agenda that, that uses the assets framework to um, you know, construct a, a, um, an anti-poverty uh, uh, agenda. So there's a number of policies that are, that are highlighted there, ways to help families uh, save, a uh, way to reform the tax code to create meaningful incentives and kind of fix its more regressive uh, features, uh, ways to help families acquire assets like affordable homes um, in, in appropriate manners, uh, and then ways to connect uh, children to savings platforms uh, as early in life as possible. Uh, there are many uh, details that remain to be addressed about these uh, ideas, but I think there are real advantages in incorporating the assets perspective into policy uh, efforts. And I think this work has really helped advance uh, the conversation. Today, uh, th there's a lot less um, uh, focus, uh, or, or on some circles there's still a focus, but um, in others I think it's more acknowledged that you know, poverty is not the result of individual uh, uh, defects. And people can confront conditions um, beyond their control, and they're going to strive to better themselves and move up. Uh, the latter. And the puzzle then is to look at what policies can create the right kind of support structures. Uh, I think there's also uh, widespread recognition that there's not a one-size-fits-all uh, solution. Uh, for some it might be education and training that might make a difference. Um, for others it's uh, stable housing uh, and a good job. Um, for others it might be how to start a, a, an enterprise uh, of their own. And these kinds of uh, interventions, they're going to play out over time. And I think an anti-poverty agenda needs to recognize this. And this kind of um, approach is really germane to people up and down the, the income uh, ladder. Um, so while there's a case to be made that building up assets can make a difference um, for people who start out with less, assets are inextricably linked to a whole range of economic security aspirations for uh, most American uh, families. And assets really are this key to mobility, as we're going to hear about uh, later today. So there's more information uh, in, in the book, but, but for this discussion, I'll just emphasize that the promise of this framework is its potential to attract support across the political spectrum. And it's, it's really kind of valuable, I think, also as a lens to look back at the contested history of the war on poverty and to look forward to, to future policy uh, discussions. So that's what we're going to do uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to continue this exploration. Uh, we have two panels uh, for you today. Uh, the first is going to look at history and the evolution of social policy efforts. And the second is going to consider how we can update our anti-poverty policy agenda in a contemporary fashion for the, uh, the 21st uh, century. Um, my colleague, Rachel Black, is going to moderate that uh, second panel. But I'll just quickly introduce our panelists on, on the first uh, session. Uh, we're going to be st started off here by uh, Alice O'Connor. I mentioned a uh, professor historian from University of California at Santa Barbara and author of Poverty Knowledge, Social Science, Social Policy, and the Poor. Um, and actually, her and the other um, extended bios are in your handouts and also available uh, on the web. Um, and then uh, Sean uh, Fremstead is going to offer remarks. He is a senior uh, research associate at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, Sean's looked at the impacts of current policies and has also written about um, the bipartisan roots of anti-poverty programs. And I'm also very pleased that 
Uh, we'll be joined by Kilolo um, Kijikazi, who is a uh, program officer at the Ford Foundation. Uh, she's done great work there, and she'll offer her perspective on how philanthropy generally and how the Ford Foundation specifically has really played an influential role uh, in this history and also has shaped policymaking efforts with the evolution of their grant making uh, strategy. Uh, so that's the lineup for uh, today, for this morning. And um, let me, uh, fortunate that you all can join us, and let me just uh, turn it over to uh, Alice. Thank you. You can clap there, I guess. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Reed, and thank you for convening this, um, and thank you all for coming. It's, um, it's always hard. It's, it's, Washington, D.C. is one of the easiest places to get an audience to talk about poverty, and that's really um, <laughs> refreshing. But one thing I, um, I, I wanted to thank you especially for is mentioning this um, or is, or is situating the war on poverty within the, lar the broader context of the Great Society. Um, and in fact, a, a, we're doing a lot of work at UCSB, a lot of public programming, um, to, to acknowledge that all of these 50th anniversaries that are coming up, including the war on poverty, um, are not just momentary things and are not, shouldn't be understood in isolation uh, from one another but are really um, very important moments in the history of democracy. And that is what, this is one of the framings I hope you keep in mind as I'm going to very, very quickly <laughs> race through in um, not enough time. I'm going to, to really give you a very um, sort of broad overview uh, of the historical roots, uh, purposes, programs, and uh, you know, and some of the lessons I think we can take away from the war on poverty. So. I hope this is big enough. Um, uh, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, I, you know, I'll try to sort of distill it into asking the question, why poverty? I mean, why rediscover it so, uh, as historians come to talk about it? Why does poverty emerge on the public agenda in 1964? What was the war on poverty? Um, why didn't we win? And I put that in quotes because I don't think that's really the right way to think about it, um, although, of course, you know, the, the win-lose the win -lose question was invited by the way, the, the, the moniker of the war on poverty in the first place. Um, but also I want to then talk about some of the insights and challenges and, and lessons for looking ahead. Um, so uh, why poverty in 1964? I mean, after all, uh, in historical memory, but to a large degree, to some degree in historical reality, and I say some degree, um, we had achieved an astonishing degree of affluence and an, and an astonishingly widespread degree of affluence in the United States um, in, uh, in, in the mid, by the mid-1960s. Uh, and certainly what, among the things that we had achieved um, is a, a greater degree of shared prosperity, um, which is to say a, a, an extended period of growth uh, in which you know the income quintiles had a, uh, had a fairly equal share in it uh, than ever before in U.S. history. So why is it that poverty reemerges uh, on the agenda? Well, the first thing I would say is that despite those that you know that sort of vaunted uh, imagery of the affluent society at the time and now, um, there was trouble in the affluent society, and that is nicely captured in the Council of Economic Advisors report of 1964, which accompanied um, uh, Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson's first State of the Union address in which he declared unconditional war on poverty, and I should add, he declared unconditional war on poverty and unemployment, um, which I'll get to in a minute. I don't, I'm not going to go through all of these things. Um, whoops, I didn't need to do that. Um, but uh, just to, you know, underscore, if I can figure out this laser. There it is. There it is. Where is it? There we go. Um, just, you know, again, one-fifth of the nation. I mean, if you think, uh, you know, the famous, the famous framing in the New Deal, one-third of a nation ill-housed, ill-fed. Well, if we're in the affluent society, we shouldn't be talking about one-fifth of, of a nation falling below a very minimal, very, very minimal poverty line of $3,000 a year. Um, a lot of these things, though, uh, a lot of these trends that are outlined in the report, again, I will not you know, uh, cover each one, um, 
remain uh, familiar, familiar stories today. I'll just point uh, to uh, the, w the bottom one here. At this, that point, a quarter of poor families headed by a, women, a woman, but disproportionately, um, half of all families headed by a woman are poor. This is not an unfamiliar dynamic uh, to, to us today. But the other important thing I think I would point out here is that the heads of all poor families, where are we? Uh, one third of poor families are headed by a person over 65, and almost one half of all families uh, headed by such a person are poor. Now that is something that has changed quite dramatically, and that has changed uh, dramatically um, because of social policy. I, 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 let me just note there, though, that um, that doesn't mean we have actually solved the problem of uh, elderly, our, our elderly citizens in need. Um, millions and millions of elderly people are living just above the poverty line, and some would say not particularly in adequate circumstances. Um, but in any case, so there's trouble in the affluent society, and that's very much reflected in this incredibly important Council of Economic Advisors report. The other thing I would point to, um, a series of, in the affluent society, a series of recessions throughout the 1950s that had left the mark and that by the uh, early 1960s had essentially created a campaign issue su such that Kennedy runs on, the, in 1960, runs on the platform of getting the economy moving again, but also um, had, you know, the economy was still in the doldrums. The, the Council of Economic Advisors report also complains that unemployment is unacceptably high. In fact, astonishingly high. It's 5.5%. We need to do something about that. Um, the other thing, though, I want to point to about that is that um, there was a, 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 a tremendous amount of discussion, especially towards the late uh, uh, 1950s, about the threat of automation. And that is actually uh, a term, I, you know, it's a more encompassing term that I think we're, we're pointing to a lot of structural dynamics in the economy that were evident at the time that were disproportionately affecting, um, well, low-wage workers, and there were plenty of low-wage workers at the time, um, but, uh, but minority and minorities and women as well who were really stuck in the parts of the economy that were going to be most affected by structural economic change. And that's kind of captured by uh, this, this slide here, or this image here. Um, labor, and a lot of people within the labor movement were fighting for a response to the threat of uh, automation by calling for a shorter work week, a 30-hour uh, work week at the, at the same, you know, essentially at, at higher wages. So, um, and in fact, the, uh, the next chapter, chapter three of the Council of Economic Advisors report actually addresses that, addresses that issue. So, uh, the, the bottom line is there's trouble and there's economic trouble in the so-called uh, affluent society. Um, but there's also a lot of political dynamics. There's a tremendous amount of political push um, for, uh, for a war on poverty. Uh, first of all, quickly, presidential politics. Um, Many, uh, you know, many of you may have heard the, the, the story of the Kennedy campaign in 1960. Uh, Kennedy, among a sea of, uh, of, of uh, people running for the nomination, including Hubert Humphrey, wants to distinguish himself. And he's not considered a particularly, you know, a particularly uh, a, a attractive or electable candidate at the time in a lot of ways. Um, but one of the ways he's distinguishes, he distingu distinguishes himself and in particular appeals to the voters of West Virginia in the Democratic primary is to say, I am the person who is going to be able to A, understand and do something about your poverty problems. And that's one of the things that's actually credited with uh, helping Kennedy win the nomination and, and win, win that, uh, the, the, West Virginia, the West Virginia vote in the primary campaign. Uh, Kennedy's also making a pitch to um, the African-American vote, but very specifically the urban African-American vote. Um, not particularly by presenting himself as a racial progressive, he was far too careful a politician for that, but by actually, again, presenting himself as the person who, was, who understood and was going to deal with the problems of poverty as well as getting the economy moving again. Fast forward to the re-election campaign in 1964, and this in the year leading up to it, uh, before Kennedy's assassination, um, the campaign is looking for a theme. It's looking for a theme that's, again, a 
helped to boost Kennedy's economic agenda, uh, which centered around a, a massive tax cut that was going to stimulate the economy, um, but also to draw in, the sort of draw on the compassion of the suburban vote. And they were circling around a lot of things, but poverty was one of the things that they were thinking about, a battle on poverty, as they called it, uh, as a way to distinguish Kennedy uh, and to, you know, to, to boost uh, Kennedy's presidential uh, campaign. Um, but then we have to uh, understand the, 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 the politics of personality going on as well, because once LBJ assumes the mantle, uh, and in those seven weeks when LBJ is trying to figure out what is he going to do, not only to sort of continue the Kennedy legacy on the one hand, but on the other hand, to make his mark, to say, I am the president, this is my administration. There's a, you know, some, uh, a lot of things in the archives about, uh, about uh, LBJ reporting to people, I like that poverty program, that's my kind of a program. And as we, uh, you know, as history has it, putting his stamp on it. So here is LBJ at the, um, State of the Union address declaring unconditional war on poverty. Um, so he immediately escalates it, not uh, quite as much in dollars as one would have liked, but certainly in rhetoric from a battle to an unconditional war. He essentially says, let's really ramp this thing up. I'm going to make it my signature program. And since I'm bringing in presidential politics here, I can't help but throw a few slides about the Johnson treatment in here. Um, this, I mean, actually, th th this gets to some very, very important things about presidential politics. Um, and, and it's not just the politics of personality, it's the politics of presidential style, but it also is the politics of having an enormously ambitious agenda and, well, knowing how to get it through. So here is uh, LBJ as the New Dealer. Um, and essentially that is how he came up and came of age and that is very much how he thought of himself as a, as a new dealer. Um, here is just, you know, the Johnson, the Johnson way, a person of the people. Uh, here is the, the famous Johnson treatment getting his way in Congress and there are just dozens and dozens of images uh, of this. And in fact, uh, there's a play on Broadway now that's, uh, what's it called, All the Way or something like that? Is it all the way? Yes. And evidently, Brian Cranston does an e excellent job of sort of capturing LBJ's treatment. Um, and this one, I really love this slide because to me it kind of captures <laughs> Kennedy trying to rein Johnson in. You know, it's sort of like uh, this, of course, the, you know, there's famous tension between the two. But in a way, this is, I'm going to... I'm going to continue, but really I'm going to break loose of this, uh, uh, of the Kennedys. Um, so, um, there's also, uh, and I'll be quicker on some of these other politics, but I, it's important to understand, I have 10 minutes left, oh, I have to move it. Um, there's an element of uh, a Cold War politics, global politics, not just Cold War, but global politics as well. And there, you know, not only I've got some slides here about the famous kitchen debates in 1959 when Nixon actually gets up and says, we are a classless society. Now think about it. I mean, this is a president using the language of class in an interesting way, but, uh, um, but also, um, the, this is the, uh, Kennedy gets in, comes into office and declares the 1960s, he goes to the UN and declares the 1960s the decade of development. So we are going to end poverty worldwide in our struggle with the Soviet Union for the control of the third world on the one hand, but also, you know, in this effort to say, to show the, show the world the, the way of the future. So that was an important, I think, uh, element as well. But I really want to emphasize uh, more, even more important than any of these other things is the social movement politics of the day. There's an absolutely huge amount of pressure, and no question about it, it is throughout the archives the Kennedy administration is looking over its collective shoulder at what is happening in the South in particular, but also in, the, in August of 1963, what is happening at its doorstep. You can really read this in the archives and some of the internal meetings when they are talking about what's going to happen with this march on Washington and what are they going to bring up. Um, so there's not only that, but there's a lot of movement uh, building going on around the country. Um, Cesar Chavez is, is organizing uh, farm workers in California. Um, the thing I really want to emphasize about that is um, that uh, let's not 
forget the March on Washington in 1963 is the March for Jobs and Freedom. This is about the politics of class as well as race. And a lot of historical scholarship has really brought that to the fore, but it's a lesson we too, uh, it's, it's an insight we too often uh, overlook. The other thing I want to, wanted to point to is in this slide here. Um, this is a slide from, and I can't seem to get this, okay. Um, this is uh, uh, JFK and Governor Terry Sanford of North Carolina. Now I bring that up because this is the politics of, you know, winning the South in a different, it, this is a different kind of Southern strategy, right? This is seeing where we can select, where the Democrats can selectively form alliances with the non-segregationist progressive Democratic Party, represented by people like uh, Terry Sanford, who actually uh, helps to launch an enormously ambitious initiative funded by a humongous grant of $7 million by the Ford Foundation uh, called the North Carolina Fund, which was about organizing county by county, town by town, around issues of race and poverty. And again, playing that very, very delicate politics of class and race in the South, in North Carolina. Uh, things have changed in North Carolina today, or maybe not. Um, then um, the politics of publicity as well. Um, I, this, this is familiar to many of us, so I'll just quickly point to the role of people like Michael Harrington, but again, just simply one among many, putting poverty in the headlines, you know, in a media that was not as fragmented as it is today, where a headline could actually draw attention and start a conversation that would be sustained. Um, but also uh, really important uh, interventions like Edward R. Murrow's Har Harvest of Shame that was about hunger in America uh, and uh, released on Thanksgiving Day in 1960. The important thing about that was essentially, you know, he's making the point that um, uh, these are the people, these very, very incredibly low wage workers, these people working at slave wages who have made your prosperity and your dinner possible. Um, so uh, that was very important. Um, and then I would want to point to the role of ideas and ideology uh, at the time. Um, this, um, we know that post-war liberalism was very much about uh, a belief in the role of government and a, and a commitment to active, activist government, but it's worth underscoring it today. Um, and it, there was not an excuse about the commitment to activist uh, government at the time. Um, carrying that out and continuing that idea was a commitment to Keynesian uh, economics. What's important about that is a absolutely the focus on growth, but also the idea that government has a role in actively managing the economy, in particular through fiscal policy that is progressive uh, rather than fiscal policy that is about dismantling government. We use taxes to actually, and spending taxing and spending to actually um, promote the social good rather than to under, undermine uh, the government. Um, but again, I want to emphasize here this idea that we're going to finish the, the unfinished agenda of the New Deal. And that is captured in some of the ideas that LBJ puts forth in his famous Great Society speech. Um, in 1964 at University of Michigan. Uh, I, I, sorry to race through this, but we can come back and talk about any of these points. So, so what was the war on poverty? Um, building on all the things I just said, sort of this idea that we have a number one weapon against poverty, and that's the language they used, and it was economic growth. It was um, not just, you know, any kind of economic growth. It's Keynesian economic growth. It's economic growth at full employment. Um, and this is really the biggest rationale for the Kennedy tax cut that was not passed until 1964, which in the State of the Union address, I mean, LBJ's agenda is to get that passed uh, it, so that he can do what uh, the other things that he, he wants to do. Um, so the, the um, full employment uh, e economic growth. Um, and I will say, despite their acknowledgement of some of the debates around uh, structural economic change, uh, very limited, and uh, I would argue too limited, and many people argued at the time, too limited structural uh, interventions to do deal with the uh, problems of uh, uh, area underdevelopment and, uh, and some of the infrastructural problems uh, and labor markets. I only have five minutes. Okay. Um, Quickly then, I'm going to just go through these slides very fast, and we can again come back to it. 
Um, but expanding and building on the, the, the social, social safety net. All of these things, uh, including food stamps, even though the actual program was created in 1964, built on New Deal programs. Uh, so, um, but, and then I, I really do uh, want to mention this, uh, this whole idea of fulfilling these rights. I mean, this is a huge part of the unfinished agenda of, uh, of the New Deal, but I specifically use the language of to fulfill these rights because um, this was essentially the language that was used in the Truman Report, the Truman Presidential uh, Commission on Civil Rights that called for many of the things that were not passed until uh, the 1960s. But the point is all of this stuff is happening. All of this stuff is happening as part uh, of a war against need and a war against uh, discrimi uh, discrimination. Uh, the broad war on poverty. Okay, so the more focused, narrow <laughs> war on poverty, um, no slouch itself, uh, uh, is, is you know centered on the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. Um, some of the programs Reed already uh, mentioned about uh, human capital enhancement, um, but I really want to focus on um, the Community Action Program. Um, I would love to talk about institutional reform because I think it's an underappreciated dimension of the war on poverty, but I want to get to some other things, so I invite you to ask me to come back to my points about institutional reform because really, really an important part uh, of the war on poverty. Um, but I, I really want to emphasize because this is the part that our debates in Washington even among progressive allies of things like fighting poverty tends to leave out when we're talking about the war on poverty and that is community action. Uh, the grassroots war on poverty and this was about particip participatory economic as well as social and political democracy. Um, this was about using, uh, in fact, using a lot of interventions that had been sort of experimented with at the local level with funding from foundations like, uh, like Ford, um, these built on the gray areas programs in the, uh, in the 1960s. Um, to challenge the local power structure, but also to get funding directly from Washington so that poor people uh, could have a say in uh, how the money was spent, which of course helps us to understand uh, why we didn't win, quote unquote. Uh, again, we'll talk some more about, there are many, many reasons here, but what I want to uh, focus on here is um, the politics of uh, massive resistance has a tremendous amount to do with the, with the well, uh, the success that a lot of these community action programs were having at, specifically at challenging that local power structure and actually empowering poor people to do things like run for office and to, and to do things like uh, run local uh, community health uh, clinics, to run local employment agencies, all of these things outside of the range of the local uh, um, uh, uh, local funding agencies and, and local power structure. Um, but it met, among other things, uh, with massive resistance, not only, not only in the ferociously segregationist South, which it did at every single step in the way. We cannot, cannot uh, underestimate the importance of massive resistance. And I really want to say that's a lesson we have to continue to learn because we're right back in the politics of massive resistance today. Um, but it also met massive resistance in the urban North in the big, from, the, from big city mayors who used every single possible bureaucracy bureaucratic channel they had to resist having funding, uh, funding funneled into the hands of people they didn't want to have it uh, in the hands of, but also uh, agricultural growers in the South, low-wage employers. There was a tremendous amount of resistance to the changes and the challenges that the war on poverty uh, presented. So uh, I have to get to a couple of insights uh, from uh, looking back. Um, I want to underscore uh, I think Reed was getting at this before. The war on poverty is not just uh, what we tend to talk about it today as today when we are defending it against attacks by people like Paul Ryan. It was not just a series of federal interventions from the top. Um, it was actually about the mobilization I of ideas, of institutions, of politics. I mean, all of those things working uh, together and of people uh, working together. Um, the, uh, as, you know, as I've been underscoring here, it was largely fought on the ground, which was wh uh, it, why it was so controversial, but why it had so much potential uh, for change, I, I would argue. Um, 
poverty didn't end. Absolutely, that did not, does not make the war on poverty a failure. In addition to many of the other things that come up uh, when we're saying, you know, we didn't lose, uh, the, uh, we didn't fail, the poverty, war on poverty didn't fail, look at what happened to incomes. I want to underscore some other things. Um, Yes, it did show that the, the power of social policy to improve well-being, but it also left an amazing legacy that is lasting uh, today. All of these community action agencies, you know, all of these struggle, struggling community-based uh, institutions, one of which I will uh, refer to, the California Rural Legal Assistance uh, Program, still running strong, one of the best legal assistance programs uh, in the country. Um, and that is a, one of the legacies of the war on poverty, civil, uh, civil law, representation in civil law uh, for poor people. A um, couple of things about uh, cha the challenges ahead. Um, I think uh, when I talk about overcoming the great divides, yes, we're familiar with these great divides of our polarized politics and of our hugely uh, unequal, uh, unequal economy. But I really want to uh, get us to focus on the great divide between then and now, the aspirational divide. Um, we seem to have given up as a, as a nation and certainly as a progressive uh, coalition uh, with the politics of high aspirations, with the politics of actually saying we, it's in our capacity to end poverty. And I know it's controversial in Washington to say such a thing and it sounds completely naive, but I am absolutely convinced that until we actually return to that politics of high aspirations, we are, no, we are not going to make uh, progress against uh, uh, e economic, uh, economic inequality. Um, the other thing I would say is we absolutely need to uh, 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 overcome the myths of failure. One myth of failure, of course, is the one we hear constantly from the right. And let's not forget, I mean, this is not really an alternative analysis of numbers. I mean, it is fabrication, and it's easily proven to be fab fabrication. Um, but also, um, the myth, I think, that we lost the war on poverty because we tried to do too much. I think that is a historical myth that we need to get over as well. So, uh, recapturing the narrative, um, which is not just by, or not actually really by fighting against Paul Ryan's lies. Because as long as we do that, we're stuck in his framing and the right's framing of the issues. We need to get, we need to get beyond that. And to say this is about uh, creating a just economy, which of course is my second uh, point about broadening the reform conversation, not just about tinkering around the edges and not just about improving the lives of individual people and families. That is very important, but we need to get going on how we are going to reform the, the horribly skewed economy that we're living in uh, right now. Uh, we need to, uh, I think, return to the politics of class, but a, a politics of class that is raced and gendered uh, in ways that the war on poverty was actually uh, pushing toward, and that absolutely is possible. In fact, it's necessary. You can't have a politics of class without a politics of race and gender um, as well. And then two final points. Never, 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 never underestimate the power of massive resistance, but also don't underestimate uh, the power of, um, of grassroots activism either. And this is a slide of uh, the Moral Mondays uh, movement in North Carolina. Okay, I went over time, but thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we'll just leave that then. Stay up here. Oh, okay. Um, I'll just go ahead and get started here. Well, that was great, Ellis. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of the things I really appreciated about that is sort of the historical depth. I think it's something too often in D.C. we have very policy sort of statistical based 
discussions of this, um, and it's kind of really refreshing, frankly, to kind of bring the, the, the history in. Um, in thinking about the context and substance of the war on poverty, I, I just wanted to highlight a few things, and some of it will echo um, Alice's remarks. First, of course, this, this notion that the, co the context, the economic context, even the global context, was um, fundamentally different. I mean, when you look at, say, between 1947, 1964, when Johnson declared the war, family incomes at both the middle and the bottom had increased by more than 50 percent in real terms. And actually, top end incomes had increased too, but not as quickly. So you had inequality declining. So you really have this sort of, you know, I, I, want, I don't want to overplay the, the shared prosperity stuff, given the extent of racial, gender, other sorts of um, inequalities going on. Um, but it was a very different context than we have today. I think the other thing to remember is it was no accident you know, the, we sometimes see the 50s um, as kind of a dead era of social policy, but of course you had the accumulation of the New Deal things going on, things like the minimum wage, the creation of collective bargaining. Um, you had the rollout of Social Security, and Social Security was always being expanded during this period, even in the 50s. It wasn't kind of a forgotten thing. Um, you also had massive spending on transportation infrastructure. I mean, it was really a peak period in the 50s, you know, job creation. And I think, you know, that... One of the lessons I take from this is that kind of stuff needs to be part of any war and poverty um, agenda. Um, you have the GI Bill, too, of course. And you had a, a marginal tax rate of, I think it was 91 percent um, up until 1993. So, um, or 63, I mean. Um, we would, um, second, I think there's a tendency in both the media and politics today to think of the war and poverty is mostly involving um, what conservatives call these days welfare. Basically, any today it's kind of any means-tested program in that vocabulary, but also what liberals call the safety net, which is a kind of similar, you know, typically liberals will include um, certain social insurance programs. They don't have a means test, but I think there's still something of a limited um, um, framing. But, you know, clearly the war on poverty, as Alice showed, was not so substantively narrow. Just a couple of things to highlight. I mean, welfare in its kind of AFDC guys, kind of pre, which was the precursor of temporary assistance for, for people who aren't as old as some of us in the room, um, welfare was just not a big part of the, the war on poverty. And it actually, people were as conflicted and um, there was as much upset about welfare in, 19, in the late 1960s as there was in the mid-1990s in many ways. And there was kind of reform efforts. And, if, and the, the, the legislation that happened in the 60s on AFDC was more conservative. It was things like getting rid of work penalties, um, which the tax rate on, on income in AFDC was 100 percent in the in the, for most of the 60s. It was things like creating the first um, work program, the work incentives um, program. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, what much more um, this period was about was the creation of things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Those, I think, are the most significant um, legacies. For children and not only adults, I think it was very much an opportunity focus. I mean, you see this in the Equal Opportunity Act. Um, it was about promoting equal opportunity through health care, nutrition, um, education. Um, I've got this sheet that we put together to kind of give you a sense of the breadth and, you know, gives you a kind of feel for how, how different it was. Um, and, of course, tax cuts were explicitly part of this at the point. So in many ways, uh, you know, this was the first sort of, you know, some of it was almost supply side in, in kind of the thinking. Um, Third, I think it's very important to mention, um, I think, you know, it was Nixon's war on poverty, too. I mean, Nixon didn't use the word war on poverty. Um, he was no fan, certainly, particularly of community action and of the OEO, which he essentially dismantled. He had his own kind of vision of it. Um, but it was the Nixon administration that built on and institutionalized many of the things that start, were started by um, um, LGBA. LBJ. So in May 1969, for instance, Nixon told Congress, the moment is at hand to put an end to hunger in America itself. Um, that was his sort of war and poverty declaration. And then it was legislation adopted pursuant to that that really made the food stamp program, legislation in 1971, 1973, that made the food stamp program a truly national program with national eligibility standards, um, national um, benefit um, standards. It was essentially optional up to that point. Um, it was Nixon, you know, Nixon's family assistance program, which you know almost looks radical today, would have again created national eligibility standards, basically federalized um, AFDC. That didn't happen, but one of the options was the creation of the so supplemental security income program in 1972, which essentially nationalized sort of the state and local disability programs, um, income support programs for people with disabilities. Um, um, 
And also, really, you see a lot of that kind of leading into the, the creation of the EITC and the Ford administration and, and, and the Congress then. Now, you know, Nixon was no liberal at heart. He was, of course, operating in a relatively liberal time. But you've also got people like, you know, Hayek, F.A. Hayek, kind of the, the conservative icon today, saying, you know, he was writing in the, the um, Road to Serfdom, the case for the states helping to organize a comprehensive system of social insurance is very strong, and basically calling for sort of, you know, basic income, health insurance, et cetera. Um, you've also got, um, you know, I think a good argument to be made that there was a lot of sort of maybe not conservative, but very sort of neoliberal policies going on in parts of the war on um, poverty. I mean, Hyman Minsky, who's an economist, um, late economist, whose ideas have kind of um, experienced a revival, um, ideas particularly on recessions and financial dislocations, he argued that at the time that the war on poverty was basically conservative because it was born out of the neoclassical theory um, in which it's the poor, not the economy, who, who, are, who are to blame for poverty. And he was much more focused, you know, he was arguing basically for a job a job creation, public jobs kind of expansion um, program. You've also got somebody, Paul Krugman wrote a couple days ago about Arthur Okun, um, who was LBJ's um, chair of economic advisors. Um, he was somebody basically who thought, you know, we should do some redistribution, but it hurts growth, you know, and, and you know, it will hurt inequality and we have to be very careful and do it right. Um, and um, you know that's not necessarily a view that even the IMF holds today. Holds today. Um, so fourth, I think I'd, I'd stress this thing about Alice mentioned the um, um, push that the AFL-CIO was making for cutting the work week. I mean, this was not a high watermarked period for labor. They didn't get much of what they wanted in the 60s. They didn't get the minimum wage. You didn't see this job creation. Um, and then finally, I think. Um, you know, it's worth remembering that the men involved in the design of the war on poverty, and they mostly were men, white men in particular, um, held very traditional roles about um, ideas about gender roles. Um, Robert Self, the historian, had a great book um, called All in the Family, where he talks about kind of the male breadwinner liberalism model of, of a lot of the people in the war um, on poverty who were planning it, and the idea that um, it was going to be men who were, you know, they wanted to basically have men be the breadwinners and lead families. Something like the Jobs Corps actually, as initially designed, would have been limited to men um, under this sort of, this idea. Um, you had things like in 1961, you had Kennedy's Commission on the Status of Women. That called for, um, it's actually kind of depressing to look at it now because it calls for paid leave, child care funding, um, all this stuff um, that you know, we're still calling for. But that was out there, but I think it kind of got ignored essentially to a large extent. Um, you know, there was a period when um, in 1971, Congress, Walter Mondale passed, basically guaranteed child care, a great comprehensive uh, child development bill. That was sort of where Nixon retreated and, and vetoed that bill, kind of citing his concerns about how it would damage um, the family. And I think a lot of that was about extending child care, not just to the poor, but to the to working class and middle class families. So just to, to conclude, a, a few broad conclusions. I think it's very important to, re to move beyond sort of reductionism in anti-poverty thinking and policy today. So that means not reducing um, policy space, poverty policy space, as I think the Ryan Report does, to just means tested programs. Um, I think it means not assessing the war on poverty based solely on the poverty rate, which is a pretty flawed measure um, um, as it is. You know, certainly the poverty rate's a lot lower, but we have all these other indicators, infant mortality, various health measures, educational attainment, that are much higher and, and, and are really, um, you know, because of war and poverty programs. And I think the question then is, well, why isn't poverty lower? And a lot of it has to do with this kind of disconnection between productivity and compensation, the rise in wage inequality. I think it means having a new script for a new time. You know, I think we should avoid the idea that we can redo the war and poverty script. So whenever I hear things like, you know, about the invisibility of poverty, I want to say, well, I think the problem is today poverty is visible, but in ways that are very problematic, you know, sort of stereotypical and negative um, portrayals of poverty. And we need to think about, you know, what's the story today um, rather than retelling that story. Um, and then finally, um, I think it means not falling into the trap of thinking that um, concern about inequality, concern about sort of runaway, undeserved um, gains at the top um, are simply a distraction from kind of serious work on poverty. We know we really have to think of these things as, um, is interconnected. And if we want to make progress today, we really need to tackle you know, both poverty and inequality using all the different policy tools at um, our disposal. So I'll close there. Good morning. 
It's good to see you here. So recently, in his first address to the Ford Foundation staff, after being selected as the new president of the foundation, Darren Walker recounted his earliest experience with Ford. It was at Head Start, where he was one of the earliest enrollees in this groundbreaking program. In 1965, that was when he, he enrolled. Ford funded the research at Yale University on early childhood education for low-income children, which, upon which the Head Start program was based. Darren noted that he grew up in a small town in Texas within a family that had um, limited financial resources. Head Start helped to create a trajectory that took him to college, law school, and the Wall Street. From there, Darren elected to shift gears and go to work for the Abyssinia Development Corporation. Community development corporations were an outcome of the Gray Areas Program, and this was a Ford-funded six-city pilot project that laid the groundwork for the community action programs. Ford also created and funded the Local Initiative Support Corporation, an intermediary for CDCs. Eventually, Ford would also support the Abyssinia Development Corporation. From there, Darren went on to become vice president of the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations and president of Ford. This is not surprising because the tenants of LBJ's war on poverty were directly aligned with the mission of the Ford Foundation. First, people should be economically secure. Two, the, the, those impacted must have a voice in the decisions made about their lives. And three, the focus must be on structural barriers to achieve real change. Social justice demands that human beings be able to meet their basic needs, and this requires poverty alleviation. Poverty alleviation through safety net programs is essential for people with limited means to survive. But survival is not sufficient. Survival is an objective, but the goal for, is for every person to reach their full potential. President Johnson said, our aim is not only to relieve the symptoms of poverty, but to cure it, and above all, to prevent it. Again, this view was directly aligned with that of the Ford Foundation. And in the mid-1990s, Melvin Oliver came to Ford as a new vice president. His research, along with Thomas Shapiro, showed that while there was a gap in the income received by white Americans and African Americans, this was far outstripped by the wealth gap or the difference in net worth of families on average between the two communities. Oliver and Shapiro's research demonstrated that this racial wealth gap is not explained by income level, rate of return on investment, level of education, or family background. Instead, they asserted that the racial wealth gap is due in large part to structural barriers for, for communities of color that exist within the same policies and programs that create wealth for white communities. A case in point is the New Deal legislation that created the Home Own homeowners loan corporation to help homeowners avoid foreclosure during the Great Depression. The legislation assisted white homeowners to, pr to preserve their assets, but out of the nearly one million loans made, not one went to African Americans. To address this structural barrier um, to economic security, Oliver created the asset building program within the Ford Foundation. This approach was based on Michael Sheridan's theory that by providing low-income communities with the same kinds of incentives and structures that upper-income in, in, upper communities enjoyed, 
low-income families would save and invest in long-term assets and become economically secure. Over the last two decades, the Ford Foundation and other philanthropies have supported research that has established, one, that low-income people can and do save when provided the same incentives and structures as upper-income individuals. Low-income communities that participate in asset-building programs invest in long-term assets like homes and hold on to them. In fact, participants in these programs were far less likely to have been subjected to subprime loans and far less likely to face foreclosure than similarly situated individuals during the recent financial crisis and subprime debacle. Research also shows that current tax expenditures for asset building are skewed to upper income communities and are not effective. Ford and other foundations also supported policy analysis that developed the environment for the enactment of legislation, such as the Assets for Independence Act, that created a federal pilot project providing financial support for community-based organizations in developing and administering individual accounts. These are match savings accounts for low-income people to save for homes, post-secondary education, businesses, and, and retirement, secure, uh, retirement plans. Policy work also led to the introduction of bipartisan and bicameral, a bipartisan and bicameral measure called Aspire that would create a child savings account program that would provide every child uh, with a $500 account to be held until the child turned 18. And in addition, another 500 for every baby born into a low-income family and match savings um, for contributions made to low-income children. And policy uh, um, analysis led to the introduction of measures that would restore the solvency of Social Security without burdening low-wage workers and improve benefits for workers who remain um, financially vulnerable. In addition, Ford Foundation supports advocacy at the national, state, and local levels for it f to inform policymakers, the media, and the general public about the need and potential impact of equitable policy, equitable policy change, and would enable the financially vulnerable to become financially secure. Our grantees have laid the groundwork for equitable policy change but a permanent, inclusive, and progressive policy has not been enacted at the national level. The, the, the need is clear. And while the income gap of white, com white communities to communities of color is two to one, the wealth gap is six to one. The research by Thomas Shapiro shows that this racial wealth gap has tripled over the last generation. A just society is one in which every person is able to reach their full potential. Now is the time for equitable policy change that would enable people with limited resources to save, invest, and move from economic insecurity to sustainable economic upward mobility. Thanks. Okay, we're going to um, get some questions from the floor now. Do we have a mic floating around? Let's see. Um, um, we're going to probably do a couple right in a row so you can give me your topics and questions, and then we'll have the panelists ask. So think of your questions. I see a few hands. And um, I, I just it's really uh, great to have Kilolo here uh, to review some of the impact that the Ford Foundation has had uh, over uh, time. They were actually there at the beginning. Uh, they've been there throughout. They played a role in kind of the evolution of, of, of the policy uh, thinking, um, and it's pretty remarkable. And I guess I just wanted to start with a question for, for Alice, which is almost um, 
Um, how much um, of this stuff was um, happening beforehand? You mentioned this kind of the Truman Report that was, um, was were, were the policymakers kind of, uh, you know, their, their analysts thinking and then the moment arose? Because you spent a lot of time uh, giving us a little bit of the history of these kind of conditions that were all aligning. And this was a big uh, moment with a lot of demands, uh, a, lot of, a lot of tension. So what was the kind of trade-off between ideas that were in the mix uh, previously, and ones that were kind of uh, when LBJ made his speech, and then all of a sudden, two months later, they're ready with a, 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 a legislative package. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, uh, um, just, am I, okay. Uh, I, I'll just speak like this. And, uh, the, uh, I mean, I think at, at any moment of major policy reform, I mean, look, uh, take, take the New Deal, like the Great Society, um, and that's why, again, I think of them as really important moments of, uh, democracy building, um, those two big initiatives draw on things that are, I mean, some people talk about being on the policy shelf. I don't think that actually gets at the dynamic. These are ideas that have been cooking for a long time and that had been actually in the works. I mean, the New Deal is building on social reform legislation and policy conversations that had been going on for decades. Um, similarly, um, the Great Society did as well. One thing about the Truman Report, I mean, actually, um, that's not, that's actually, uh, that is a call, that is a call for what we need to do to achieve a civil rights agenda, including doing things like desegregating the army, including, uh, including uh, fair housing legislation, including overturning racial covenants, that doesn't even happen, you know, I mean, that happens overturning, uh, Co racial covenants, but you know, it's not until 20 years later that that agenda is realized. And that's not about narrowly construed policy ideas. That is actually about mo movement building and activism. Now, on the other hand, sort of on the policy idea front, um, some of these experiments that were happening at Ford and other places, but really especially at Ford with the Great Society and um, a lot of experimentation around what do you do about the problem of juvenile delinquency in the uh, in the 1950s. That's sort of you know the the development of policy ideas that do end up in the mix in the conversation. Yeah. And so when the moment is there, yeah. um, you know the people at Ford wrote talked about suddenly we had Kennedy in office and LBJ in office. We had somebody we could talk to you know, and to feed, and it, it creates a pipeline for policy. Yeah, ideas. well, it's interesting yeah. that you need, you need the moment, but you need the incubation of ideas that, that, right. that take some time, right. and there's someone involved in that work here. Maybe I shouldn't get too discouraged when yeah. things don't get done. Okay, so I'm going to call on like four people right in a row. You're going to stand up and quickly ask your question or comment. My friends here are going to use their pens and fingers to jot down things so they can then answer. So let's go right here. There's two women. You've won two, right? No? You, okay, one, one, two, three, and then four. After many years in the policy field, I'm working largely as a volunteer in the community on SNAP and hunger. As I read the press and talk to people, the level of contempt for the poor and the distrust of the poor, the image of the poor, seems to me worse than it's been in many years. And I would like to know if that's just in my head or if it's real. And if so, why? Okay. John? Yeah, thank you. Outstanding panel. Uh, two related questions regarding kind of the politics of ideas, uh, primarily for Alice, I suppose. Uh, one, um, there was a development, say, in the late 70s of, of, of philanthropists funding and often founding these conservative think tanks uh, or, or greatly expanding them. And often, in my assessment, these think tanks um, were often emphasizing kind of broader ideological issues and, and, and offering a sort of a broader uh, 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 vocabulary for thinking about these issues. And often the liberal uh, philanthropists were funding work that had a more empirical, often technocratic quality. And it seems to me that very broadly, what one had in terms of the conservative perspectives was an emphasis on framing issues often in an extremely effective way and really looking at kind of fundamental underlying philosophical yeah. issues versus an emphasis or an approach of kind of getting the facts out for the liberal approach. Yeah. So that's the that's first thing. Actually, yeah, Kilola, we're going to have you uh, talk about okay. that and Alice. I've just got okay. to add yeah. to that. No, no, there just talk about what, for Alice, what vocabulary do you think is most effective for this kind of progressive vision of egalitarianism and social justice? And that clearly uh, the libertarian, the Hayekian, Friedman um, vocabulary resonates deeply 
with many Americans, and it really taps into part of the American political psyche. What, you know, what frameworks and vocabularies and framing do you think are most effective in the U.S. for, for promoting this, this agenda? Okay, thanks. And then um, we're going to go all the way in the back. Well, actually, we'll start here, and then we'll go to... Uh, Sonia Michelle from the University of Maryland. Um, I've often, th I've, I'm glad that Sean Fremstead mentioned the uh, predominance of the male breadwinner wage ideal during this period. And I've, uh, one of the things I think we did mention is that um, even though welfare, welfare reform, welfare bills were actually, welfare policies were becoming more and more punitive with the work program, something, things like WIN and other things. Uh, but at the same time, because of the predominance of the male breadwinner ideal, uh, even though child care was supposed to be included in these policies, it was never, the states never really picked up on it. So this is kind of a kind of factual uh, question. I mean, do you think if child care and training uh, had really been instituted during this period, the rise in female poverty might have actually been uh, lessened somewhat? Okay, and then last one, and I've kept track, so you guys aren't off the hook just because there are a lot Hi, of them. Thanks. Um, Don Mathis, Community Action Partnership. Thanks for a great panel, New America. Um, I, I want to take Professor O'Connor up on her uh, invitation to ask about institutional reform and community yeah. action. Uh, I started in community action in 1974 in Wilmington, Delaware as a Head Start teacher. There were guard, National Guards troops on the streets nine months with weapons because of the civil rights thing. That was where my Head Start Center was. That institutional reform continues today. The President has proposed a 50 percent cut in community action in his current budget. Can you talk about institutional reform and uh, give us a little what you were teasing us about? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Comments? Contempt for the poor? Politics of ideas? I'll, I'll take the, the first two. Um, I think that your observation is, is very real in terms of this contempt and maybe increasingly um, an increase in the comfort in which people have in expressing this contempt for the poor. I uh, participated in um, several focus groups across the country uh, about two years ago, and I was so taken aback by the extent to which people showed this contempt for, for low-income folks, and uh, really disturbed by it. But what I also observed was that folks who were expressing this were like a stone's throw from being in that situation themselves. And some folks had actu were actually in that situation. They had gone through foreclosure and were living back with family members, et cetera. And my perception is that this contempt is, is based on fear, fear that um, one may slide or become too close to that which one is, is afraid of. Um, so distancing oneself from the, from the situation that one is, is concerned they will um, end up in. Um, then the question about framing and the, um, the- You fund both evidence I and discourse. I do, I, uh, I shouldn't say I, we do. Um, yeah, I, I would agree that there has been um, I would say considerable success by conservatives in framing issues and um, focusing on values in terms of their framing of issues. Um, and there is kind of a, a, I will say, stereotypical approach by um, more progressive organizations of hammering away at the, the facts. Um, with the, I think, perception, belief that one can change opinions by informing them with, with facts. And I would say that it really takes a little bit of both, that people's beliefs are based on emotion and that, that um, just factual information doesn't reach one's emotions necessarily and that you have to be able to tap into the, the values that people hold and understand why they believe what they believe in order to inform that, that belief. And so your framing of an issue has to, I think, always be factual. And I have um, concerns with, with framing that is um, seemingly successful but doesn't rely on facts. I think it should be factually accurate, but also have an understanding of why people believe what they believe and be able to speak to that. Sean? Um, well, you know, one quick thought on this contempt for the poor thing, whether it's increasing, I, I don't know, actually. I, 
I think you know one of the things is there's a lot of you know one of the things that I think the right kind of with the ideas stuff you know thinking back about Charles Murray and the underclass debate there was a real successful attempt to racialize you know particularly welfare um, and you see when you read something like the the work of Martin Gillens the Princeton political scientist and he really you know explains this I think pretty convincingly um, and so you have cleavages where people will say I mean I'm sure this was you know some of the polling. Um, um, a cap is done also sows this. I mean, people are supportive of assistance for the poor, but they detest welfare. <laughs> and, you know, so there's these kind of cleavages that you have to kind of look under. But what about the vocabulary for social justice, right. though? I, I mean, like how? How to, you know, I think part of this is, I, I do think on the left, I think we often talk about poverty and the poor in a way that does implicitly other otherize it. And I think that's a problem. And, um, you know, I, was, I did something looking at um, how people self-identify in class terms recently. And it's very interesting. I mean, most, it's about 50-50 now in terms of people identifying as working class versus middle class. And that's actually the case, too, with very low-income people. If you look under, um, 50, or under people under $20,000, the majority of them identify as um, working class. The other big group identifies as um, middle class. And then a small portion, you know, and these are very low-income people identify as lower class. I mean, it's black women who have the highest kind of self-identification as working class. I think there's a way we haven't kind of come up to this reality that, you know, we're talking about the working class here and it's a diverse, <laughs> you know, it's not the old white guys that you think of, you know, that yeah. we talk about in politics. Yeah. Oh, can I just yes. say one thing about the childcare thing? Because I think that's very important. I think, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know, I think it would have been lower. Um, I think people's lives would have been a lot better too and kids, you know, would have been better off is probably the um, important thing. And I think it would have changed the politics. You know, I think it would have, um, you know, I think it wouldn't have been as much about welfare hysteria. Um, I think it would have been, you know, women's work was increasing, you know, single women's work, women, um, and women did this amazing, you know, when you look at their educational attainment, I mean, it's really extraordinary, and it didn't, you know, there was no big bang in 1996 where this all happened because of welfare reform. It was something happening for 30 years, and I think, we don't tell that story very well. I think it's often, we often focus in on 96 and say that was a disaster, um, and all this stuff happened, but, you know, and Alice, we could take a class in community action and in right. institutional reform, but what are your uh, uh, brief oh, so, comments well, uh, there? So just on, the, on, the, uh, on this child care point, uh, I, I think a really good way of thinking about this too is to, uh, uh, to, to know that, to, or to recall that uh, when Head Start was, was started, um, universal kindergarten was not, uh, you know, kindergarten was not available everywhere. And uh, so there was a problem. OEO was really worried about this problem of the over-income people who wanted access to Head Start because it was such a great thing. You know, we want, we want you know, pre-K and kindergarten for our kids too. And so I think that similar dynamic, you know, this is a real cross-class kind, of kind of a program in childcare. Um, Contempt for the poor, I, I think what has made it ex extremely powerful, I would agree, there's always been huge amounts of contempt for the poor, white, black, working, not, I, you know, but uh, especially in the United States. Um, but I think what makes it especially potent right, ne right now, A, it's politically acceptable. If not, actually, it's, it's actually politically, you know, promoted. Um, it is accompanied by an extreme contempt for liberalism and for any the idea that we have a collective obligation. Um, and also, though, it you know it's, it sort of builds into one of the problems with the war on poverty was that it did perpetuate this notion of the other America that actually you know was actually pre quickly demolished this notion that the poor are some sort of submerged third or sub fifth or something. It just was actually readily demolished by uh, evidence. And we s haven't found a way of talking about poverty in a way. And that this is why bringing back the language of class, I think, is so important. On institutions, um, yeah, there's a lot going on there. Um, OEO itself was an institutional innovation, this idea that we actually need uh, a federal agency that is by and for <laughs> Uh, uh, advocacy for uh, low-income people. That was an institutional uh, innovation. But also at the, at the community level, it was operating on a lot of different levels. Number one, we have way too many fragmented services. We actually need a, a kind of institutional innovation that acknowledges that people don't live in silos the way that policy happens. They actually live full lives and they need some way of you know, having a more holistic way of, of, uh, of working 
you know, of, of, of achieving some kind of economic uh, uh, security. But also there was, the, some of the institutional innovation had a lot to do with uh, volunteerism. You mentioned you're, you're a volunteer now. It was actually like uh, recalibrating the relationship between the federal government and um, civil society um, in such a way that they weren't seen as competing either ors. It actually was about this notion of partnership so that you could actually draw on the volunteeristic energy without saying this should be about charity. Um, and so I think those are among the things. The other thing I would mention as an institutional innovation, the notion that the Council of Economic Advisors could be a, a, an advocate for the poor. That was kind of novel. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly is novel if we look at if we think about it um, uh, today. Um, and then, in terms of the politics of ideas, uh, I completely agree. Um, but I, the one thing I would add to that, uh, number one, is that it is based often it's based on a false premise that empirical research itself doesn't have an ideology. Of course, it has an ideology, and and that's you know those think tanks are not willing to acknowledge that they have ideas, and that's a huge part of the problem. The other thing I would point to when you talk about what kinds of vocabularies speak to me, anyway, well, my go-to has always been um, the Economic Bill of Rights. Uh, you know, L FDR's Economic <laughs> Bill of Rights, which is pr purposely framed in the language of um, of, rep of early R small R republicanism. So we're adding the freedom from want to, you know, the, the, four, the classic four freedoms. Uh, the, you know, the freedom of religion, the, the freedom from fear, um, freedom of speech, and freedom from want in order to be a fully participating uh, citizen of a democracy. One needs to be able to live free from want. That is an old idea, uh, you know, in the American vocabulary, and I think we need to um, bring it back. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, the first panel. Um, you can help me uh, thank them. Uh, and uh, we will shift here with the second panel. Rachel, give us a moment as we all shift seats here. Hi, everyone. We're transitioning to our second panel here. Um, my name is Rachel Black. I'm with the Asset Building Program here at New America, and I'm going to be ushering us through the rest of our conversation this morning. Um, just to sum up what I think I heard uh, in our first segment, um, the war on poverty was the product of a specific place and time. It was an outgrowth of specific economic and social conditions, and it was a product of specific political actors and their priorities. Um, but a lot has changed in 50 years. Uh, the nature of work has changed, the structure of the family has changed, and along with these changes, there's also been a shift in what a modern family needs to get by and ultimately get ahead. So. The question that I'll be putting to our panel here is, what does a 21st century anti-poverty policy agenda look like? So to kick us off, we'll have Melissa Boteok. Uh, Melissa is the Vice President of the Poverty uh, to Prosperity Program at the Center for American Progress. She's also the Vice President of their Half and Tin Campaign, and uh, we heard Sean talk about um, how poverty really can't be conceived of as a monolith. And we know that the way that well-being is conceptualized is very diverse. And uh, Melissa and her team at Heaven 10 uh, really produce sort of the standard bearer of uh, capturing sort of a holistic picture of uh, well-being in their annual indicators report. Um, after Melissa, we'll head over to Elise Gould. Uh, Elise is the Director of Health Policy Research at the Economic Policy uh, Institute, and um, as one of her roles there, she is the co-author of their State of Working America. This is something that a former colleague of mine called the book with all the numbers in it. Uh, I think that this was a sort of complimentary reflection on what a comprehensive resource it is. 
Um, after Elise, we'll hear from Willie Elliott. Uh, Willie Elliott is the director of the Assets and Education Initiative at the University of Kansas. Uh, there he is really um, pioneering research and making the connection between uh, savings and children's educational outcomes. Uh, we're also very proud to claim Willie as a senior research fellow in the asset building program. And uh, if you didn't see them on your way in, I encourage you on the way out to pick up uh, their new publication, Harnessing Assets to Build an Economic Mobility System. Uh, you can also access the report as well as other supporting uh, documents at assetsformobility.com. And uh, finally, we'll hear from Josh Barrow, and he'll tell us if any of the promising ideas uh, that we've heard from Melissa and Elise and Willie are actually going to go anywhere uh, in the current political environment. Uh, Josh uh, is five days in at a stint at uh, the New York Times, where he's a national correspondent, um, and he'll soon begin writing for a new uh, Times website focused on economics and politics and data. Although I suspect for most people in the room, uh, Josh's work is uh, most recognizable by a piece that he published last year in Business Insider called The Problem with the Republican Anti-Poverty Agenda is that it doesn't exist. Uh, so we'll tease that out a little bit more um, in his comments. Uh, after each of the panelists make their comments, we'll open it up to question and answers from you. Uh, we also want to encourage people uh, viewing on an online audience uh, to participate in, uh, in this conversation. So if you have questions, you can tweet them to us at, at AssetsNAF and use the hashtag TalkPoverty. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melissa. I want to thank Rachel and Reed in the New America Foundation and my colleague Sean Fremstead uh, for inviting CAP to co-sponsor this event. Um, I've been asked to touch on a few things today and to focus my comments on income assistance and the safety net element of our War on Poverty programs and my uh, fellow panelists will be talking about some of the issues surrounding the labor market and assets. So I'm going to touch on first the role of public assistance and work supports, um, some of the successes that we've had over the past 50 years, um, touch on the question that Alice raised in terms of why do we still then have such a high poverty rate, and then turn to some of the challenges and holes we have in our system of work and income supports and where we can go from here to begin creating a 21st century safety net. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that when we speak about the role of income assistance and work supports, many of which were either created or built upon uh, during the war on poverty, there's two key points. Um, one is that the safety net, um, and I use this term loosely, Sean mentioned that's a very narrow term, but for the purposes of today, our system of work and income supports I'm referring to as the safety net. It's not something that happens to other people. Poverty isn't something that happens to other people. Um, over half of all adults are going to spend a year of their life in or near poverty. Um, that means that many adults and, of course, children are going to encounter elements of our safety net. About half of adults uh, with children are going, we use the EITC at some point between 1979 and 2006. And so when we're talking about the safety net, it's something that we all have a stake in personally, as well as from this wonkish policy angle. It's something that we all need to be concerned about. The second is that in addition to the humanitarian justification for a robust system of work and income supports, there's a strong economic justification. Um, if you look at the most recent recession, programs such as the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, formerly known as food stamps, unemployment insurance, were some of our strongest anti-recessionary tools in terms of uh, you know, filling in for lost demand when the economy tanked. And so we all have a stake in a strong and robust system of work and income supports, not just for our personal, uh, you know, a personal what could happen to us there by the grace of God go I, but for our overall economy, which affects each of us, each of us every single day. And so I want to start with those two framings because I think a lot of what has happened over the 50 years is that the issue of poverty and the safety net has become someone else's problem. It's become othered. And I think when we start from a shared framework of this is something that we need as a society, it opens up the conversation to something that can be a little bit more constructive. So given that, um, I think, you know, Reed raised in the opening, um, you know, one of the things you often hear conservatives say is that we waged a war on poverty and poverty won. But rather than speak in um, proverbs, I'd like to actually look at what the, what the track record is and let the safety net and the system of work and income supports that was established or expanded upon as the war on poverty speak for itself to the extent that uh, inanimable, inanimable objects can speak for themselves. So the first is that um, there's a great new study, and if you haven't looked at it yet, I'd commend you to look at it, that came out in December last year from Columbia University. And it showed that when you 
take the safety net into account and a poverty rate that um, you know, looks at these programs, there's actually a pretty strong track record. If the poverty rate between 1967 and 2012 fell from 26% to 16% today when you take those programs into account. When you subtract those programs out, the poverty rate actually went up. Um, and so we see our safety net really overcompensating for an economy that is not working for too many people, which I'm sure my colleagues later on the panel will touch upon. So it's not the war on poverty that's failed, it's really the economy that's failed. Um, and as Reed mentioned, you know, 45 million people were lifted out of poverty last year by various elements of our safety net. Uh, the, CAP, the report that CAP has out in the back has a few examples. Senior poverty would be about five times as high without Social Security. Medicaid is associated with a drop in the infant mortality rate. Our nutrition uh, assistance programs have all but ended extreme hunger um, and malnutrition in the United States. If you look at pictures from Appalachia or inner cities in the 1960s, children with protruded bellies. Um, we have other problems with nutrition and people struggling against hunger today, but we've mitigated a large portion of the problem because of a bedrock system of, of, of SNAP. So then why do we still have 15% of the population living under the traditional poverty rate, about 46.5 million people? Uh, it's funny, there, there's been a lot of talk today about um, the, we need to do a better job communicating, and I think that we do. But a new poll from Half and Ten shows that surprisingly a lot of the American people really do get it. They understand. When we forced a choice in this poll between poverty as an issue of personal responsibility or poverty as a problem because jobs don't pay enough, cost of living is too high, things haven't kept pace, two-thirds of Americans agreed with the structural cause of poverty, including majorities of conservatives. So I think that overall, the American people do understand that poverty is a structural problem. In fact, 61% uh, of Americans say in the said same poll said their family's income is falling behind the cost of living, and 25 to 34% of Americans report serious problems keeping up with their bills. Um, and this is not separate from the conversation about uh, that Sean raised on income inequality. If you look at the top one percent, Americans own the top one percent of Americans own forty percent of the wealth, and the share of income going to the top one percent has more than doubled um, since the war on poverty began. So we've seen sort of our economy growing apart, and this influx of low wage work. Um, and at the same time, we're asking why we've seen an expansion in the safety net. In part, it's a response to an economy again that is not working for too many people. So our next presenter is going to cover more on that front. I'll, I'll leave her to it because she's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to take her points away. But one thing I do want to point out that shows this interaction is a recent study that CAP put out that showed that if you were to raise the minimum wage to 10 10 an hour for the Harkin Miller bill that's out there right now, we'd see a $46 billion reduction in food stamp spending over the next 10 years. So there is this interaction that's going on between um, lack of good jobs and use of the safety net that I think it's important to explore and why I'm so glad we're all in the panel together to kick off that conversation. So while I want to emphasize that all the solutions I'm about to put out on the safety net cannot really be considered in the con without the context of the broader economic trends, I do want to say that our safety net is imperfect. And so I've been asked to focus a portion of my remarks on some of the ways in which uh, we can modernize our safety net and make it work better for a 21st century economy. I don't have time in the next, I think, five minutes uh, to go through um, you know, an entire discourse on the safety net, but I'd like to flag a few holes um, that I think uh, are worth discussing and some of the solutions that I hope, uh, or you know, conversations that I hope can help us put on a path towards solutions. One um, of these uh, holes that I want to flag is something that actually um, has begun to be raised recently in discourse, which is the issue of benefit cliffs. Particularly in the area of child care, um, there is a phenomenon where in many states, if your income goes up even just so slightly, you're put over the eligibility level uh, for child care, and all of a sudden you lose your benefit. Um, and this can create a system where um, if you get a raise at work or you work more hours, you're actually worse off because you're losing the child care that allows you um, to be able to uh, work in the first place. And so one of the solutions to this is to be able to gradually taper off benefits as income goes up. Not cutting benefits back so short that there's always an incentive to work. That will just make people worse off and undercut their ability to make ends meet. The solution is to look at a program like the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is one of our most successful anti-poverty tools, where benefits and the tax credit rises to incent work and then slowly tapers off as your income goes up. That's one way to structure safety net programs that are, have these cliffs in them um, so that moving forward, people are able to uh, progress towards the middle class without suddenly losing important work supports. 
Another issue is access to work and income supports. This is actually another area where the Ford Foundation has really been uh, instrumental. Is in, you know, sometimes in uh, some safety net programs, people are going to multiple offices to try and get access to benefits. Um, they are, uh, the bureaucracy on the ground and administering them, and particularly because of asset tests that I'm sure will be raised later on in the conversations, trying to verify people's assets can create enormous amounts of paperwork and can make it difficult for low-income people to access the benefits that they're eligible for to get a hand up. There's a lot of different ways that we can address this. Um, there's the work supports a program that the Ford Foundation and others are leading uh, that is actually piloting a lot of really innovative strategies in the states that are streamlining access to work and income supports. There's one-stop benefit centers that streamline, uh, create a single point of entry for people to be able to get multiple benefits that they're eligible for. But this is one way to sort of both ease state bureaucracy as well as enable low-income people to get the help that they need in a efficient way. A third issue is something that we've raised, sort of we touched on uh, multiple times throughout the conversation, but haven't really taken it head on, which is TANF. Um, the, the system that we have for our temporary assistance is in many fundamental ways broken. States are incented to find ways to kick people off the program as opposed to find ways to actually reduce poverty. Um, and this is a, important ways we can address this are things like creating subsidized jobs, making sure people are able to get the education they need to get better wages in the long term. Um, there's a number, there's, I could spend the whole, my whole conversation talking about TANF, but I do want to flag it um, as put a pin in it as one point of conversation where we really need to figure out how to make our welfare system work better and have more of an um, explicit emphasis on poverty reduction. Another is childless adults, which is um, the only group that our uh, safety net and our, our tax system taxes deeper into poverty. Um, and so this is actually a fairly easy fix. The president proposed in his budget uh, a very exciting initiative, uh, expanded earned income tax credit for childless workers. Um, and this would help make sure that those workers um, are able to benefit from uh, tax credit that uh, also rewards the time that they're putting into uh, to work and dig uh, digging themselves out of poverty. And then finally, this is uh, not really a sexy issue, but Inadequate funding is a big hole in our safety net. <laughs> you, know, you, have, uh, you have one in four individuals who are eligible for some kind of affordable housing who aren't getting it. Um, it creates a lot of issues with squeezing other expenses, forces some families into homelessness. That's just one example. But I mean, I think it's very, we can talk about how to reform safety net programs, make them easier to access. But at the end of the day, um, if we want to get people out of poverty, it's going to require a combination of economic reforms uh, that are going to make our labor market work better for people, as well as investments in work and income supports that are going to provide people the pathway they need out of poverty. So just putting that out there. <laughs> um, and just to sum up, I think you know we called for uh, the need for to put our money where our mouth is a new social movement. I have some good news on that front. Um, our recent poll showed that 70% of Americans um, support a national goal to cut poverty in half in 10 years. And that even when you qualify it with you have to spend more money and raise taxes and you have to ask business to do more, even when you put all those qualifiers on it that would make support drop, people still wanted it. Um, and so I think that there is a latent appetite for the kind of national commitment um, that we want to help drive um, as part of this conversation. Um, and I'm excited to continue the conversation with my fellow panelists so we can talk about how to get there. Thanks. Great, thank you for having me, and um, great uh, fellow panelists in the earlier panels, fantastic ideas, and um, really enlighten the issue. So Melissa already mentioned that um, the economy has failed. The economy has clearly failed American families, and what's been going on in the economy in terms of economic inequality, and what maybe we can do with the labor market is what I'm here to talk about. So here's what we know about inequality, and I'll just do it briefly. As, as you've already heard, we write a book at EPI, The State of Working America. You can get all the numbers and figures there. We're a bunch of data nerds, and that's what we like to do. So you're lucky that I wasn't asked to um, do PowerPoints. There'd be lots of charts and all sorts of things. You're saved from that. But if you want that, you can find it on our website. So for the last three decades, workers' wages have not kept up with our growing economy. Today, workers are more productive than they were 30 years ago, and yet they have little to show for it in terms of wage growth. Economic growth has created the potential for growing living standards, but unfortunately, that didn't materialize. The overall story in recent decades is one where the wages of the vast majority fails to rise with a growing economy. Between 1979 and 2013, productivity grew 64.9%, while wages at the median only rose 6.1%. The growing gap between productivity and wages is due to a pulling apart of the top of the wage distribution. Workers have to be near the top of the wage distribution to even see average gains in the economy. 
And what about those workers at the bottom, what we're talking about today? Transfers are important to families at the bottom, but they depend on wages from the labor market for the majority of their income. The hourly wages of the bottom fifth, so the bottom quintile of the distribution, saw declines over the last 30 years. In fact, the inflation-adjusted wages of the 10th percentile of the wage distribution fell 5.3%. So they fell 5.3% between 1979 and 2013. The declines among the lowest wage workers are relevant for the minimum wage, which I'm going to get to in a minute. These workers did not see gains, but losses in hourly wages. And today's low wage workers are more educated than they were 30 years ago. Furthermore, low wage households are working more today than three decades ago. It is clearly increasing hours and not increasing hourly pay that is served to increase annual wages. So low-wage workers are more educated, more productive, and work more than ever before. And yet we see the gains to a growing economy continually passing them by. We've already heard some about the trends in poverty. Some great research that's come out in the last year from Columbia University has taken the supplemental poverty measure, um, which is a more comprehensive measure of the official, than the official poverty measure, trying to take into account different government tax and transfer programs. Um, and what they've done is they've created a historical series, which is great to look past um, history of what has happened not only with the official poverty measure, but also with this new supplemental poverty measure, which takes many of these government programs into account. And we can compare poverty rates with and without these government programs, with and without the tax and transfer system. What we clearly see with their data is that taxes and transfers have taken us part of the way in reducing poverty. And for this, I'm talking about the period 1967 to 2007, though obviously poverty was exasperated in the Great Recession and its aftermath. But market-based poverty, so the pre-tax and pre-transfer poverty rate, failed to decline in that period, that 1967 to 2007 period. So market-based incomes failed to decline, um, failed to reduce poverty. And in fact, the poverty rate rose dramatically um, over the last five years, while it didn't decline in the, in the 30 or so years before that. So we've made some progress on the tax and transfer side, and no doubt more needs to be done. Melissa's pointed out some great policy directions we need to move in. But we seriously need movement on the wage side if we're truly interested in improving living standards for those at the middle and bottom of the income distribution. And also, I just want to note as a side comment um, that the role of inequality has, divor has dwarfed everything else in terms of rising poverty, most notably family structure, one thing that people like to bring up on the other side, which has played a small and diminishing role in poverty in recent years. In fact, over the last 30 years, the role of income inequality in increasing poverty is over four and a half times more important than family structure and six times more important over the last decade itself. Given their overall trends in inequality, it's not surprising that market-based poverty has failed to see any gains in recent decades. And while I'm 100% behind strengthening the safety net, we need to really tackle these on all fronts that we can, from SNAP benefits to housing vouchers to unemployment insurance, it is also clear we need to work to reduce poverty by improving the labor market for low-wage workers. So how do we do that? We want an economy with broadly shared prosperity. There's no magic bullet but a laundry list of policies that increase from increasing the minimum wage to promoting collective bargaining, to making full employment a high priority by reducing excess unemployment, to better regulating financial markets. Today, given the political con context, and hopefully um, I'll get some positive feedback from the end of the panel, um, I'm going to talk about the minimum wage. The first thing it's important to note about the minimum wage is that it is not primarily an anti-poverty tool. It is a basic labor standard. The federal minimum wage is currently more than 25% below its real value in the late 1960s, so it has eroded dramatically. When labor standards erode, both low and moderate income workers see downward pressure on wages. So partially restoring the minimum wage, which is what raising it to 1010 by 2016 would do, would mean both low and moderate income workers would see gains. Of those who would get a raise if the minimum wage were increased to 1010, over 50% are in families where the total family income is less than $40,000, but around 90% of them are in families where total family income is less than $100,000. That's a feature, not a bug. Boosting a labor standard helps not just the poor, but also the middle class. And the minimum wage is well targeted to those who truly need the extra earnings. The roughly 25 million who would get a raise if the minimum wage were increased to 1010 are not, as we sometimes hear, teenagers working after school jobs for extra spending money. The vast majority are adults who depend on the earnings from their minimum wage job to make ends meet. Just 12% of workers who would see a raise are under the age of 20. The average age of workers who would see a raise is 35. Just 14% work less than 20 hours per week. On average, workers who would see a raise earn half of their family's totally, total income. 
Many are parents. If the minimum wage were increased to 10, 10 an hour, nearly one out of five kids in this country would see at least one parent get a raise. The bottom line is that an increase would go primarily to workers who depend on these earnings to get by. I've emphasized that the minimum wage is the basic labor standard, but it's not to say that raising the minimum wage to 1010 wouldn't reduce poverty. It absolutely would. On net, it would get billions of dollars to people living below the poverty threshold, $5 billion according to the recent CBO report, and raise many over the line. The poverty threshold, we can argue, is a pretty arbitrary line, but CBO's estimates are that it would bring nearly $1 million over that line. And their estimates are simple simulations. The most rigorous rig um, academic work shows that it could bring more than 4 million people out of poverty. But by either estimate, the minimum wage is a tool for fighting poverty. Furthermore, it would do it without increasing the federal deficit, which in the current political climate at least doesn't mean it's dead in the water. And as Melissa pointed out, it can even reduce SNAP spending, perhaps other policies as well, though I might suggest instead of taking that reduction in spending, maybe redirecting that money towards work supports. Um, for instance, reliable, high quality, affordable childcare so people can actually maintain that employment. I'll end with a brief discussion of the relationship between the minimum wage and the EITC, um, which is another policy I think is really important to keep in mind. First, there are two, these are the two main policies we have in the country that are designed to address the problem of low wages. The minimum wage provides a floor for the wages people get in the market, and through the tax system, the EITC provides subsidies to workers who earn low wages and also live in low-income families. Opponents of the minimum wage tend to see the minimum wage and the EITC as competing with one another. Supporters of the minimum wage, on the other hand, tend to see both policies as crucial and, in fact, strongly complementary. And here's why the minimum wage is so important to an effective EITC. The EITC substantially raises the after-tax wages of workers who are eligible for it, so it increases the incentive to work. But in doing so, it actually serves to lower the wages offered by employers because workers eligible for the EITC are likely to accept lower wages because they know they will get that subsidy. In other words, because of the existence of the EITC, low-wage workers, low-wage employers can pay their workers less. This means that low-wage employers actually capture a significant chunk of the total expenditures on the EITC. That means that the EITC, which was designed as a subsidy to low-wage workers, also effectively functions as a tax subsidy to low-wage employers. That's why the EITC needs the minimum wage. A higher minimum wage puts a stronger floor under the wages that low-wage employers are allowed to pay and thereby limits their ability to capture a bigger share of the total expenditure on the EITC. It's probably important to note that the CBO report that came out last month highlights that issue, citing studies that conclude that more than a quarter of the total expenditures on the EITC is captured by low-wage employers. The CBO concludes that an increase in the minimum wage would shift some of those benefits back to the workers they were intended for. When thinking about how efficiently the EITC is targeted, that's really an important thing to keep in mind. The bottom line is that a higher minimum wage is one way to help reverse this country's four-decade-long upward redistribution of wages and incomes to help reduce poverty. Another way is a more generous EITC, particularly an expansion of benefits to childless adults and non-custodial parents, because those groups are hurt by the negative wage impacts of the EITC, but don't get substantial benefits. But in any event, the big takeaway is that we should do both as part of the 21st century anti-poverty program. Thanks. So first I want to say I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here and to talk. I thank NAF. I also want to thank Ford Foundation and Charles uh, Stewart Mott for their funding. Uh, really, uh, I guess before I became, I don't know, we, we started this AIDI, AIDI uh, Institute or, or Center, I didn't think about how important funding is. Uh, <laughs> and, and we have a limited amount of funding, and so uh, it really allows you to think in independent ways, which I think is important. It's something I want to touch on just quickly before I, I get into my scripted remarks, is I think how we have uh, uh, thought about the poverty issues, uh, we've totally lost the conversation around it. And I say the progressives kind of lost the conversation in such big and important ways that it even shapes the kinds of questions that we ask. It shapes our vision of what we think is impossible. It shapes our fight for what we fight for. You understand? We're fighting for things that, that are only incremental steps. And I don't understand it. I don't understand the whole, maybe because I grew up poor, and uh, homeless at times, and I just want to see people have better lives. Do I want to see them get just beyond poverty when we know the poverty level is so meager 
and, and so uh, un insufficient? Or, or do we want to really make a difference in their lives? What Americans want is an opportunity to fight and to have the opportunity to be in the middle class, right? And, and, and the middle class has to be fabricated in the society we live in today. It takes inter institutional interventions to make sure that we have a strong, robust middle class. And so I, I just want to start off with that kind of, of, of conversation is that we really need to think about exactly what we think is possible has been shaped by others. It has been shaped by others. We have to reimagine how we think about poverty, what questions we ask, and what really is possible. Um, and because I only have a limited amount of time, which is, which is a necessary amount of time, I, I need to read. So I'm going to read to you so I can stay on point, but I'm already behind because I, I had that um, off tangent there, but I'm sorry. Um, many Americans assume that wealth is generated by income, and income is generated by hard work and ability. This equation comforts our collective psyche, validating the American dream. If this was really how the U.S. economy worked, anyone would have a roughly equal chance of making it if they apply their talents and effort. However, in the Assets and Education Initiative's new report, Harnessing Assets to Build Economic Mobility System, we posit that initial asset levels may be critical for determining people's ability to build future assets and future income. In other words, labor income alone may not be enough for building assets, or economic mobility for that matter. Where you begin may have quite a bit to do with where you end up in life. Building assets and moving out of poverty may require an initial level of assets to begin with. In a society such as America, where there are large wealth disparities, initial assets may lock certain groups of people into patterns of poverty. At some point, ask me a question about patterns of poverty. That's the thing that really bothers me, are the patterns of poverty, where generations of families remain poor or near poor with little hope of escape. In addition, the systems with which one interacts throughout life may influence one's economic trajectory. For example, the current bifurcated welfare system facilitates higher income families in accumulating assets while either discouraging lower income families from accumulating assets, or at the very least, doing little to facilitate asset accumulation among lower income families. As a result, we posit that the bifurcated welfare system may end up exasperating wealth inequality in America, further perpetuating patterns of poverty, and then endangering the American dream. Which the American dream is, I think, while we have this conflict or, or contradiction between low income people, because we understand and believe in the American dream that effort and ability equals desired outcomes in them wanting uh, to, to start new programs and stuff, because it fights against those two things. In harnessing assets to build an uh, income mobility system, we use longitudinal data from the panel study of income dynamics. I'm going to skip through the kind of the methods parts. You can find it uh, in our report, and I'm going to just get to the findings, uh, because I've, I've used up some time. So findings on the association between initial assets and future assets. With quantile regression findings suggest that families at the 75th percentile enjoy over five times the return on asset holdings experienced by families at the 25th percentile. More specifically, those at the 25th wealth percentile experience a 35 cent return for every $1 increase in net worth compared to $1.81 for those at the 75th percentile. However, it's important to point out that even low wealth families benefit from having more initial assets. This suggests that families at any economic level may experience greater potential for upward mobility if supported by policies that facilitate asset building. Findings from growth curve models that we did by income level, for higher income families, which here is defined as 50,000 or above, which is quite low, that initial income is associated with more rapid wealth change among high but not low income families. This could reflect a number of factors, including the ability of higher income families to save more quickly, uh, we also find that initial wealth is associated with slower changes in wealth of high-income families. For lower-income families below 50,000, results suggest that uh, suggest they accumulate net worth at similar rate regardless of initial income. Uh, this is relatively promising, suggesting low-income families have a similar potential for asset accumulation as those uh, earning more. With regard to the association between initial assets and future income, Based on the quantile regression results, when controlling for initial family income, net worth only consistently contributes to future income among families with high uh, initial net worth. This may suggest a threshold relationship, uh, that is, a certain amount of net worth is required before we see an association between net worth 
in increases in income. However, this uh, made us think what, what would happen if we broke out income into its different parts, labor, capital, and transfers, reflecting the different strands through which American households generate income today. When we do this, we find unlike net worth, initial capital income is consistently associated with uh, family income. For each $1 increase in capital income in 2007 family income before the recession uh, increases by $1.22 at the 25th percentile and $5.26 for those at the 75th percentile. After the recession in 2011, uh, it increases by $0.58 cent for those at the 25th percentile and $1.29 for those at the 75th percentile. Looking at the growth curve and lag models that we did, for higher income families we find initial wealth uh, buffers higher income households more from income change than lower income households. It's, it's important uh, to begin to think about how assets also affect income because a lot of our thought has been around income and consumption, it, but, but really they're, they're, co they're connected, they're tied, and each are important. So initial wealth buffers higher income households more from income change than lower income households. Thus it appears that wealth helped to buffer higher income families from income change during the recession but did not play the same role among lower income families. Moreover, among higher income families, there appears to be some evidence of a virtuous circle where income predicts net worth and net worth predicts income, which perhaps reflects the more com complementary nature of income streams uh, in the economic lives of these relatively advantaged Americans. It is important to note that income appears to be more a more consistent predictor of net worth than net worth is of income among higher income families, so, so more research is needed. Findings for lower income families, they are consistent with the idea that low-income families may face a ceiling on what they can earn. I think this is important as we spend so much effort and energy, rightly so, on increasing uh, work participation, is that it has limits to what it can do, and it cannot create economic ability uh, in the way that we think it can, at least in my estimation. It's an important part of it, and we need to continue to do it, uh, but there might be ceilings uh, to, that, to that process. So in conclusion, in sharp contrast to the myth of a blank economic slate in which an individual's future prosperity aligns with his or her effort and ability, evidence presented in this report begins to suggest that initial asset levels may significantly influence the power of labor income to generate additional wealth and income. If this is true, labor income alone is not enough. To combat poverty and provide economic mobility, U.S. households' income should be thought of as a three-legged stool. And this is really the main point of our, of our report. We need to focus not only on labor income, but also on capital and on transfers. They play an imp important part in the overall process. Only this integrated approach is likely to provide real economic well-being for Americans. However, as it stands now, transfer income is often at odds with the creation of capital income among low-income families. The consumption-based arm of the welfare system focuses on providing recipients with enough income to achieve subsistence, not on building the assets that will help them achieve economic mobility. Yeah, we'll stop there. In fact, programs in this arm of the welfare system have means tests that ensure that once households have a monicum of assets, they are no longer eligible for the program. Uh, the income threshold for determining eligibility is, is similarly low, ensuring that most households lose access to the consumption supports soon after they have enough income to barely uh, be not poor. By definition, structure, and objective then, these programs are not designed to help Americans build assets human or financial, needed to assure that all Americans have equal opportunity for moving up the economic ladder. The United States needs a policy intervention capable of transforming our bifurcated welfare system into a unified economic mobility structure. The policy development proposed in, the, uh, in our report is economic mobility counts. EMAs are a tangible way to implement a rethinking of the U.S. welfare system, moving from a bifurcated approach that delivers desperate effects to a unified commitment to economic mobility opportunities for all, essentially building assets for everyone. Uh, EMA's lifelong integrated progressively funded savings accounts designed to assist account holders in attaining major financial goals in each life stage may build on the promise of greater prosperity articulated in the war of poverty. Acknowledge the families today, economic structure and delivering a real upward mobility for most Americans and envision an asset empowered future for all. So. Uh, I'm done, but quickly is we, we don't believe that uh, savings by itself is enough. We do believe that income savings in transfers together can be enough to eliminate poverty. And we need to find ways to have these different 
uh, parts of the uh, personal income work together and strengthen each part of that. We focus so much on just income for the poor and getting them just above poverty, knowing that most of them are going to fall back into poverty at some point. We need to strive a little bit farther and a little bit longer. We need to help them build their assets so that they can move to the next job level. And so their earnings earn them uh, enough to, to, to make it in society. All right, so thank you. Great, thanks. It's, uh, it's great to be here today. This has been a really interesting discussion, and I will try to pour cold water on everything. Um, so as, as both uh, Melissa and Elise noted, uh, the supplemental poverty measure fell from about 26% in 1967 to 16% in 2012, which points to both a huge success and a huge failure in the war on poverty. The, the huge success is a 38% relative reduction um, in the poverty rate over that period. And the failure is that, that more than 100% of that shift was attributable to transfers. So we had no progress at all um, on change, changing market income in order to lift people out of poverty. Um, and so actually, you know, if, if we're talking about was the war on poverty a, a top-down effort or a bottom-up effort, the top-down effort appears to have worked quite well, um, although there is more room. Uh, the bottom-up effort, may, maybe we would have had a, a, even a growth in, in pre-tax poverty without those efforts, but really where you can, where you can see the effects is, is through the transfer programs themselves. So where does that leave us today uh, in terms of what's politically feasible to, uh, to further reduce the poverty rate? Um, so first, I mean, there's more room for more poverty reduction through tax and transfer programs. And in fact, that's been a huge part of the political story over the last six years through this economic turmoil. Um, you actually only had an increase of about half a percent in the poverty rate through the recession and the weak recovery, which is a remarkable achievement uh, given that we went through the worst recession since the Great Depression. Part of that was autom automatic stabilizers, and part of that was policy choices, a temporary increase in SNAP allotments, um, several extensions of unemployment insurance benefits, and now um, benefits coming through the Affordable Care Act. Um, but I think we've mostly run that out politically, at least for the medium term. There are a number of uh, some economic but more political limits on further poverty reduction through transfers. Um, one is simply that, you know, as, as we lean more and more heavily on means-tested entitlement programs to reduce poverty, you necessarily have increased problems of poverty traps where people face significant marginal tax rates as those programs phase out. That can be adjusted through some of the things that Melissa mentioned with eliminating benefit clips and, and better synchronizing programs. But there's also just a fundamental problem that the, the bigger you make those benefits, if you want to continue to phase them out, you have to phase them out somewhere. Um, we also do have a, a long-term fiscal gap that somewhat limits our ability to make commitments. That problem is generally overstated politically in, in Washington, and it's been somewhat alleviated by um, improvements in health care inflation. But there's a related political problem, which is that there's a bipartisan consensus that any new government program now has to be paid for in some way because increasing the deficit would be a really big problem. Um, and so that, I think, is what will ultimately kill a lot of ideas that look politically promising for more poverty alleviation through transfers, such as the president's proposal to expand the earned income tax credit. There is openness among Republicans to an increased earned income tax credit for childless adults. In fact, Marco Rubio has proposed one. Um, but I do not think that Republicans and Democrats will be able to agree on how to pay uh, for an expanded earned income tax credit. Rubio would like to pay for it by reducing the EITC for adults with children. I don't think the president will go for that. Um, and I think, you know, the, the best marker of this right now is that we can't even get agreement on another extension of unemployment insurance, which has often been a matter of bipartisan consensus. Uh, so right now I'm not hopeful about more uh, Im improvements in poverty through transfers. Uh, so the other question is what can we do to change pre-tax income to bring wage growth more in line with economic growth and to raise the wages of, of people with low and moderate incomes. Uh, the first thing on that list is, is minimum wage, and that is something that I think, well, it's already happening at the state and local level, and I think you will continue to see state and local increases there. It polls well even with Republicans, um, but there does seem to be strong Republican resistance at the national level to doing it. Um, but there is room to do this at the state and local level, and the consensus of the research is that the disemployment effects within the range that we're talking about are somewhere between small and zero. Um, and so I expect to see more minimum wage increases. Um, 
there's also more room on macroeconomic policy to tighten the labor market. Um, I think people don't talk enough about monetary policy as a poverty and inequality issue. Um, a greater focus by the Federal Reserve on, on maintaining full employment um, would promote wage growth. It would not only protect people in recessions from un unemployment, but it would, uh, it would increase the labor share of, of GDP. Uh, this is an issue that conservatives focus on a lot. They're very concerned about a Fed that they see as run amok. I rarely see liberals talking about it. In fact, I, I tend to find the most vocal voices in favor of loose money are a small but very noisy group of conservatives who promote market monetarism. Um, and it's remarkable how aggressive the Fed has been in spite of the fact uh, that nearly all the political pressure they face is from the right. So I think that if the left took up the issue of monetary policy, there would be some room to, to nudge the Fed and therefore achieve wage growth. There are also th theoretically opportunities on fiscal policy, but that relates closely to what I said about transfers. I don't think that there's politically a lot of room um, for more uh, fiscal stimulus. Um, you could also have policies that promote more union density and more worker bargaining power. Um, I the I think politically the the time it's been a challenging time for that. I think the time that you might have gotten card check done was 2009 2010, and and that didn't happen. One thing that I find very interesting is yesterday uh, the Council of Economic Advisors had a briefing on the pres the economic report of the president, which talks some about these issues and has that chart on how all of the reduction in poverty is due, is due to transfers. And I asked Jason Furman at the at the briefing, you know, what is, what does the administration see besides the minimum wage uh, as policies that can be used to address that gap and to get wage growth in line with GDP growth? And he didn't say anything about. Uh, macroeconomic policy aimed at a tight labor market or about unionization or, or worker power, all of the policies that they threw out were education and human capital policies, universal pre-K, uh, college affordability programs, efforts to hold colleges accountable for, for quality and cost, um, apprenticeship programs, and these have merit and I think in, in the long run um, could promote low and moderate wage growth, um, but they are both very long-run policies. It's going to take a long time for universal pre-K to show up in the form of, of higher wages and, and lower poverty. And it also looks to me like a missed opportunity. Again, this is, this is something that the right is focused on, macroeconomic policies, opposition to unionization. It's something that the left has not taken up as much as it might. Um, finally, I'd note, um, on the, on the asset side, you had a very small bore program that the president rolled out in the State of the Union called MyRA um, that is designed to promote um, savings among people who don't have access to retirement accounts through work. Um, I, I see that as a program that would have probably positive but very small effects on, on poverty and on savings. I would note that historically, programs to promote saving tend to accrue their benefits mostly to people at the upper end of the income spectrum. And I think there are structural reasons that that happens. Partly they're done through the tax code. And tax benefits tend to be worth more to you if, you if you pay a lot of taxes. And then also you just have a higher capacity for savings among people with higher incomes. So I think that uh, it could be promising to, to get people to at the lower end of the income spectrum to save more, but it's always going to be a struggle to make sure that those programs actually produce benefits in the area where you are aiming them. Um, and then uh, uh, Matt Iglesias wrote in his last piece for Slate um, ab about a week and a half ago about the new burrito economy um, and how the, the, he said, imagine a burrito stomping on a human face for the rest of history. It's basically about how it's a trend in the economy that we've seen in the last few decades and will continue to see of growth in low wage, low wage, low skill jobs. And there is something that can be done through policies like minimum wage increases to uh, increase those workers' income, and some of that will happen. Um, but ultimately, there's only so much you can do to increase the numerator of the living standard of somebody who has relatively low skills. You can't push their, uh, their wage above the, the productivity that they produce. What you can do is, is change the denominator. Um, which is to say bring down the real cost of the things that make up their standard of living. Um, a big part of the reason that we've had income concentration at the top over the last few decades is the accrual of rents to people who own capital, and that's for all sorts of things, intellectual property policy, um, regulations of real estate that have protected incumbent homeowners and people who own valuable land at the center of cities, um, licensing restrictions that drive up the costs of things like medical care that people consume. And so policies that, that drive down those costs can increase real living standards for people with low and moderate incomes and somewhat reduce inequality. That's, again, a long-range policy, um, but it's something that I think could be more politically achievable 
than some of the other the, than things basically that cost money. Uh, child care is an example there. I think you know expanded access to child care um, would do a lot to to raise living standards and to reduce inequality, but it runs into a lot of the same problems as transfer programs, i.e., that it costs money. So I, I would just you know say in in, in summary, uh, you want to right now look for for ideas that don't have fiscal costs. That's, I think, part of why people have focused on the minimum wage, but uh, a broader agenda than the minimum wage will have to be a little, a, a little more creative to work. Great. Thank you all for your really thoughtful comments. We have about five minutes, so rather than um, I taking my own prerogative to monopolize uh, the panel with my own interests, we'll go ahead and hit the ground running with your questions. So. Um, as soon as we identify where our microphone is, it's right there. Uh, so similar to Reed's previous directive, um, pithy questions, make sure that they are questions um, so your fellow audience members can make sure and get their uh, questions in too. So if we could see a show of hands, I think Alice in front has one. Okay, I'll make it quick. Are you uh, embracing a Henry George type of, uh, I mean, you know, you really sound like Henry yeah. George when you're talking about rents, and, but I, I am yeah. quite serious about that, you know, and a, 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 well, it doesn't have to be a single tax, but a, a much higher taxation of uh, rents from. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see a land tax. I, I'm of the view that a federal land tax is unconstitutional. I know that that's a, a, a controversial issue, but I think it would be a great thing for, for state and local governments to do. Um, I think it's, uh, I live in New York City, I think it's odd that Bill de Blasio is focused so much on trying to tax high incomes when the city could probably more politically easily and more economic, in a more economically friendly way try to tax the value of, of high-end property in the city. That way the Russian billionaires who are buying up all the condos in the south of Central Park who don't pay income tax in New York because they live in Russia um, would actually end up paying in. So yeah, I think, I think there are real opportunities there. But it's also, it's not just about tax policy, it's also a part of why um, economically productive American cities have become so unaffordable to the to both the, the poor and the middle class is just that we have a limited stock of, of housing units and I think this is something de Blasio is getting right um, not only is he focusing on making sure that uh, there are affordable housing set-asides but he is taking the approach that you need to allow people to build a lot of units um, in order to be able to get more people into the city and, and drive prices down Um, so, Willie, I wanted to ask you to go back to the um, the issue that you said that you would um, talk about, patterns of poverty. Yeah, I think one of our, our biggest problems is, is not that there's poverty, but that the poverty is persistent among certain groups over time. And, and to me, that's the, the bigger issue. We don't want to create, in America, we believe in effort and ability, and we really strongly, and we all buy into that. We're not socialist. Uh, but what we're it frustrated is when we see the same groups of people continuously falling into that, and we begin to understand why that's occurring, that there's structural reasons for that to occur. So what we want to do is reverse those structural things, eliminate patterns of poverty, and that should be our, our main goal. It, there are going to be some people in life who don't put forth the effort and are going to struggle. Right? It's just reality. It's hard to say in a group like this. But we want to be assured that they have the opportunity and that's where, what the government should focus on, not on what the individual is doing, but on what they need to do to create and eliminate patterns of poverty in society. Where we have, because it's not that black people are inferior to white people, but black people have worse outcomes than white people all the time. I want to eliminate that part of it. And so that it's some white people, some black people, some different kinds of people, women, men, are having problems that aren't structural in nature. And we won't see patterns among groups. We'll see just a random selection of people. So, so that's like my like Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I want to build, I wanna build up on that, because I don't think it's just a problem at the very bottom. You have about a third of the country living below 200% of the poverty line. And if you look at sort of some of the longitudinal data, most people are cycling in and out, but they're in this chronic state of economic insecurity. So while I would support efforts that target those who are you know, very, very disadvantaged, I think there needs to definitely be a complementary focus on the broader low wage labor market issues as well as the work and income supports that reach further up so that there's actually a straight pathway out. Um, I'm all for you know, 
tackling deep and concentrated poverty, I think it's critically important. And I think it's often the thing that's not easiest to talk about. And so it gets ignored in our public discourse. But I wouldn't say that that's the most important thing above others. I'd say it's a one part in the system. Because I think the low wage labor market work is really important. Right, I think <clears throat> also I think what um, often gets missed is when we talk about mobility, we forget that increasing mobility also means that some people are falling. And that's why it's so important to lift up the bottom. And that's why I think I would focus more on income inequality, on wage inequality, because I think that uh, mobility is great. I believe in opportunity, but when somebody moves up, maybe makes it a middle class, and we have a more mobile society, that means someone has fallen down from the middle class. We need to make sure we have an adequate safety net to make sure that we have reduced inequality and lifted everybody up so that nobody has so far to fall. I, I would add to that. As, our, as, a, as we fight for this adequate safety net, it, it can't be just moving people into near poverty. It's moving people from abject poverty into near poverty so they can return to poverty um, time and time again throughout their life. In that way, in that sense, uh, focus on economic ability is important, but all the time having a base. But how do we define that base? What is the floor below which people should fall? And I think right now we fight for moving people into near poverty and call it victories. Uh, and I think we need to start thinking about how do we move people farther than that. And on your political fe feasibility part of this, I am frustrated with the idea all the time that what we do and what, how we frame things is whether or not it's politically feasible. What will work? What will make people better off? That should be our question. What do we need to do to improve their lives? And if we need grassroots movements to make it politically feasible, let's do that. Let's fight for something that's worth fighting for. I don't have much longer to live here in life. I'm 43. And I want to fight for something worthwhile. I don't want to, I don't want to fight for uh, near poverty. Right, well that's exactly what Alice was saying in the first panel, let's be more aspirational. I definitely agree with that and we think about mobility, one of the things also we want to think about is, well if we want people from the bottom to get up to the top, then we also have to remember that, well that means that we want those rich people, those rich kids to have to fight for everything that they get. We don't have a society where that, that occurs. And I think, sorry, one more thing on Willie's point about making sure that there is um, you know, equality of opportunity. I think two things we haven't touched much on, but what I want to raise towards the end of our panel, is some of the demographic shifts that have happened over the past 50 years and also moving forward, both racial as well as gender. Um, you know, we have a, a situation now where back in the 1960s, women were about, you know, a quarter of breadwinners or co-breadwinners, and today they're close to two-thirds of breadwinners or co-breadwinners. Society hasn't caught up. We don't, the only country doesn't have paid family leave, only industrialized country that doesn't have paid sick days, not no uh, sort of comprehensive childcare system, and that is sort of driving so the feminization of poverty in some ways. And the, the, and the race issue, I think, is also we're not. It's not only a moral issue, which it absolutely is. It's also an economic competitiveness issue because by you know 2042, we're going to be a country in which there's no clear racial and ethnic majority, and the high levels of racial and ethnic disparities among young children today um, are definitely going to follow us into the future if we don't take immediate action to really invest um, in closing them now. OK, we're going to shoehorn one more question in here. So hands up. OK, right next to you, Juliana. I just wanted to ask Melissa, she started to answer it there. You know, what is the potential for a movement of women around these um, work family issues? Because the wage gap, the you know, women are a great success story the last 50 years, except not in the last 12 years. Wage gap has stopped. Women's increase in labor force participation has stopped. You know, and what is the potential there? And uh, just thinking about Darren Walker, one of the things that the anti-poverty movement did is to mobilize women in those Head, Card uh, Head Start centers in which when he was a child, I was a college student working a summer of 65 in a Head Start program. Uh, there was a lot of mobilization of the moms and that was, what, that was part of it. The moms were thought of as a constituency that would be mobilized and they were. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that there is a lot of potential. You're getting to see at the state and local level, um, states beginning to take up things like paid sick days in Connecticut or paid family leave. Uh, I think the minimum wage also is a women's issue, considering that two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. Um, and you're beginning to see sort of this momentum at state and local level that's you know absent a functioning Congress that wants to actually pass legislation, some of our best bet is, uh, and at the current state of play, is to begin to percolate at the state and local level and build those movements, and also to begin to do the public education necessary to lay the groundwork for some of these larger changes we need to enact to really uh, move the dial in a big way and an aspirational way. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, uh, 
the FDR story of where he told the labor leader, go out and make me do it. I think all of us hopefully will leave this room with a uh, imperative to go out and make our elected officials do more on this issue because it's only going to happen through effective organizing. And go to halfandpen.org to get more involved. <laughs> uh, Willie, he has something else? I'm sorry. Well, I want to say one more thing. A student once asked me, a, a Jewish student asked me, what is it about being black that is, uh, that, that, that is so bad? In, in a sense, really, it was, it was kind of a question that he asked. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that was a basic question. And, and I thought about it, and it was a good question. Why do, why do black people continue to fail? What's, what's so bad about being black? It, it, it's, it comes back to this opportunity thing. It is that, it, who cares if someone hates you and, and doesn't like you? Right? That matters, but it doesn't really matter. What really matters in our society is that you block my opportunities for moving up the ladder. That's what's been unique about being black in America, in my mind. It's, the, it's, it's not that they don't want you to marry their daughters or whatever else. It's the fact that they block your opportunity. When, I come into, when somebody comes in my class who's black, they have a bar to reach that's higher than everybody else. I shouldn't say my class, in a sense. I think it's the same for women for other kinds of isms, right? And so that's the problem. I think that's what opportunity comes. What you want is an, a fair opportunity to fight to move up the ladder. Just give me that. You don't have to sit next to me. You don't have to be my neighbor. But give me a real opportunity so that I know when you tell me that you're failing because of your effort and ability, it's because it's my effort and ability. And I can look myself in the mirror and say, work harder. Son, work harder because you're not doing enough. I want that kind of opportunity in this country for everyone. And that's why opportunity is so important. Opportunity demands that there be a base, a floor below which people can start at. That's what initial asset levels are about. Give people enough assets so they can compete with everybody else. Yes, have a floor, but give me the opportunity to rise. Or don't critique me when I don't rise. Don't say it's my fault when you haven't given me the structural opportunities to succeed in the first place. That's what makes a black man mad. That's what makes him struggle in life. Until we understand that, and I don't think it's different for women, Native Americans, for all these different groups. I'm using black because, hey, look at me. I'm black. I can't hide it. Right? It's been my experience in life. That's the thing that we need to fight against and change. That's what we're up here doing. That's what I'm doing. And on that note, unfortunately, we're going to have to call the event to the close. Thank you all so much for coming. Please joining me in thanking our excellent panel. They will be sticking around for a few minutes. So if you have questions, please, please come on up.